Okay. Yeah. Okay. Definitely yeah. looking to it. Thank you. Sorry. Good evening and welcome to the regular council meeting of October 15th. If Councillor Latina would please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the town, um, town clerk please take attendance? Councilor Breton? Here. Councilor Forrest? Here. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Latina? Here. Councilor Lesser? Here. Councilor Ralph? Here. Councilor Spinella is late at work. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morin Bella? Here. Thank you. We are still working on. Um, getting the volume of the microphones to a good level. And I was told that the, um, the amplification in the back of the room is louder than in the front of the room because if the speakers in the front of the room are too loud, we get feedback. So if you are having trouble hearing and you're in the front of the room, if you move back, it should be actually louder um, for folks in this room. But I think the... Um, it's loud at home now, so we're halfway there, Mr. Rue. Everything you said tonight came through as clear as a bell. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. So our first order of business tonight will be a presentation from the MDC on the long-term control plan update on the Clean Water Project. Welcome. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for having us. And, uh, very appreciated of where you have us on the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here tonight is to give a presentation. I had uh, come here about a year ago to do a presentation talking about the MDC's long-term control plan uh, for, the, for the combined sewer overflows in the city of Hartford as well as the sanitary sewer overflows in the communities around um, last fall. And I talked about how we were shifting towards an integrated plan and that I would come back in a year to give you an update as to where we wound up landing with all of what we're recommending, what we're proposing to DEP. So uh, this is uh, the cover slide. Uh, this, the, the picture that you see here is actually the, the cutter head to the tunnel boring machine in South Hartford. Uh, up front in the slides, there was a list of, pres of, of acronyms uh, that are in the presentation as well as I may use them just because they're so, I'm so familiar with them. But if you ever want to go back to, as to what that acronym is, it was right up front in the presentation. So the agenda, I'm going to give a quick uh, summary of the evolution and accomplishments of the MDC's long-term control plan. And then I'm going to talk about how moving forward, we're moving towards an integrated plan. Where did it come from? What does that mean? And, and what are the high points of the plan that we're recommending? and then uh, go over the alternatives for implementation and then uh, cover next steps. So the Clean Water Project for the Hartford MDC uh, requires a combined sewer overflow long-term control plan. It was originally submitted in 2005 to the DEP and was approved in 2007. That long-term control plan is required by the consent order with the MDC and DEP to be updated every five years. So in 2012, we updated the, uh, we originally updated the long-term control plan uh, and it was approved in 2014. And now what we are here today is for the next long-term control plan update, which is due at the end of this year. Quick, uh, quick highlight of what's uh, been, what was in the 2014 plan on what's been completed versus what is ongoing. Um, we completed sewer separation, which is the green area shown on the, on the map that you're looking at. We were to complete those. They've since been completed last year. Uh, we were to complete sewer rehabilitation or continue to do sewer rehabilitation of the existing sewer system in all the towns around Hartford. Uh, you'll see in a bit the, uh, you know, what we've done in, uh, in Wethersfield. Uh, complete the treatment plant improvements at the Hartford Wastewater Treatment Plant. Those will be done at the beginning of next year. Uh, significant improvements at the plant that increase the, uh, the treatment capacity. And uh, we were to build the South Tunnel, uh, which goes from the treatment plant that's shown in the bottom right corner of the figure 
over to, it goes from the treatment plant over to West Hartford. It's the blue line that's shown going across uh, South Hartford. That is the South Tunnel Project. What was remaining is all of the combined sewer overflows that aren't in those shaded areas. And our prior plan had contemplated building one tunnel system to pick up both the CSOs, the combined sewer overflows that are in downtown Hartford as well as up in North Hartford. That was the project that what was remaining is what we wanted to look closer at uh, with this new plan. So what has been completed in Weathersfield uh, to date, uh, the highlighted sewers that you see have been rehabilitated uh, since 2005. So 32% of the sewer system, uh, which is an aging sewer system, probably, you know, the pipes that were rehabilitated are probably approaching 100 years, if not longer, old. And we, uh, we rehabilitated those pipes, 32% of them. Uh, the two projects that are listed recently completed, those are specific lining projects um, that we just completed last year. And then projects under construction, there's the Goff Brook Overflow Project that I heard some residents uh, talking about uh, this morning, on, uh, this <coughs> evening on the way in. And also there's the Rocky Hill Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, Upgrade Project, uh, which is currently ongoing and uh, also should be completed next year. This is a, uh, the progress of where the MDC is um, with their reduction of combined sewer overflows. There's a lot on this table. Uh, if you just focus on the bottom uh, of the table in the bowl, the system total, basically in 2004, before we started this clean water project, we were overflowing 1 billion gallons of combined sewer overflows to receiving water bodies in a typical year. And with the work done to date, we've cut that in half to 524 million gallons, which is substantial. So there's been a lot of work uh, that's been done and there's been a lot of progress towards reducing those. What's remaining after the salt tunnel goes online will be 464 million gallons remaining of combined sewer overflow. What the consent order requires is for us to bring that down to zero. So what, we're, the, what our plan is looking to address is that remaining 464 million gallons. Uh, the bullet that you see on the bottom, uh, the Save the Sound uh, recently uh, released a report a couple weeks ago talking about the water quality of the Long Island Sound. That's part of the reason why we're doing this clean water project is because of the quality of water for the receiving, uh, for say the Connecticut River, Long Island Sound and whatnot. And they, re they uh, issued the report saying that the water quality of the Long Island Sound has significantly improved since the time that we started. It's not just the Hartford MDC's projects, it's collectively, it, it includes uh, work done in New York as well as other projects in Connecticut as well. But at least the dollars being spent are improving water quality, which is what uh, we're here for. So where are we headed? Um, when I came here uh, last year, I presented, I think, this exact slide talking about we were going to go to an integrated plan. Basically, the EPA, uh, back in 2012, around the time that we were finalizing our last long-term control plan update, issued guidance to municipalities with combined sewer overflows that said that they could consider integrated planning. Prior to this guidance coming out, everything that the MDC had to do related to combined sewer overflows was considered in a silo. It was only what are the projects that are necessary to address combined sewer overflows and all the other things that you need to do for rehabilitating your sewer system or aging treatment plant or pump stations was ignored as part of that process. What integrated planning allows you to do is to take everything into account, prioritize the project so that you do the, the, the most important project first and then down the line, and it may not necessarily be a combined sewer overflow project, it's the most important project. So that's what we were looking to move towards, all within uh, what the EPA has is an affordability analysis which says how much the, the, the residents can afford to pay uh, for this program. So why are we going to an integrated plan? Uh, I think this graph pretty much uh, says it all. Uh, basically, the MDC, I don't need to tell you, uh, but the spending rate over the last de decade is not sustainable. So if you're working on the left-hand side uh, of, the, of the graph, um, the blue is the CIP spending, and the, I think it's orange, uh, the orange is the uh, clean water project spending. So you see, working from the left-hand side over to the right, those are years, and that's the spending in a given year over time. So from when we started to now, there's been a substantial increase in spending in order to address these combined sewer overflows. And clearly, continuing to spend at this rate uh, is not sustainable. So that's something that we need to revisit. <clears throat> Another reason why uh, to go to integrated planning um, with all of that spending that we've done, 
Uh, while there was a reduction in combined sewer overflows and, and an improvement to water quality that I talked about earlier, the infrastructure in Hartford and the towns around is now failing at an alarming rate. It seems like it's almost twice a month or more that we're having an emergency repair where a sewer is collapsing. So while we're addressing these, these combined sewer overflows, we're leaving this 100 to 150-year-old sewer system behind that is in, in dire need of attention. And so uh, in 2017 alone, the MDC performed 17 emergency repairs for a total of $3.5 million. Pretty sure that the number of repairs and the cost of the repairs is going to be higher in 2018. Those costs currently are borne directly on ad valorem uh, for their CIP. So what about the sewers that haven't failed yet? These are pictures and examples of sewers that we have televised in the last uh, five to ten years that show additional sewers that haven't failed yet. There hasn't been a road collapse, but these sewers are, are need attention. These actually haven't been rehabilitated yet and need to be. This is part of what we're trying to get at is to look at how we can address these. The consent decree with EPA required the MDC to to televise inspect all of their sewer system uh, uh, as a requirement. And in the process of doing that, we found a number of these in all of the towns. And, and to date, we found $450 million worth of repairs that need to be done similar to these, which is above and beyond the, the cost to address the combined sewer overflows. Again, these repairs uh, would be funded through Avalorum with the current system uh, that they have today. So basically, the integrated planning approach uh, is going to be done in three volumes. Uh, on the top, you see the buckets. Uh, the buckets represents the needs of the Hartford MDC. Those are the projects that they would need to do regardless of the combined sewer overflow pro uh, program. Related to the collection system, pump stations, and whatnot. That's what we need to do to address the aging system. On the bottom, volume two, are the projects that need to be done in order to address the combined sewer overflows. This is typical to what we did in 2012 with the long-term control plan update. What we're looking for as part of the integrated plan is the projects that fall in the middle, that basically meet a need as well as address CSOs. Those are projects that would be ranked high through our scoring process. All of this feeds into what we call volume three, which is the actual integrated plan. The integrated plan takes those projects takes the ranking, and it looks at the affordability analysis and develops a schedule for doing those projects. So there's a dual benefit in, say, the, the uh, repairing infrastructure uh, because it, it addresses the flow in the system while it's also addressing the aging system. So what do we have is two basic options uh, for the combined sewer overflow plan. The plan on the left closely mirrors what our, our plan was from 2014, which is an all-tunnel plan. It looks like a, a figure two. Uh, so it's the blue line if you follow it all along. It goes through downtown Hartford. It then goes up to the north and goes across the, the north side. And that is referred to as the North Tunnel Plan. DEP asked us to, to bring that full plan forward. The plan on the right is a proposed plan that does sewer separation in the north. So the downtown tunnel... Uh, which is the line you see on the west, or the, the, the left-hand side of the figure, the west side of Hartford that goes up. It's a blue line. That's, that's the da proposed downtown tunnel. It's still needed. But there's no tunnel that goes up to, into North Hartford. In, in exchange for doing that, we're looking at doing sewer separation where we would do the sewer rehabilitation at the same time. And basically, sewer separation is building a new drainage pipe alongside the existing combined sewer pipes so that there's one pipe for stormwater and sewer, similar to what you have here in, in Wethersfield, uh, versus conveying all that flow in a tunnel to the plant. So a comparison of those two alternatives, the North Tunnel Plan uh, on its own is less expensive. It's $282 million uh, just for the North Tunnel area. Um, so if we were to continue to look at combined sewer overflows in a silo, that's probably where we would be, which makes sense. That's what we recommended back in 2012. On the right, the sewer separation plan is more expensive to do, um, but they're not apples and apples. The tunnel plan is strictly just building a tunnel to take the flow from the combined sewer overflow outfall pipes and bring it to the plant. The, the plan on the right is renewing the existing sewer assets while we're doing the program. And so one is addressing those failures that I showed you earlier, and the other one is not. Um, and, and obviously the tunnel is one large project, and the sewer separation can be, can be divided into multiple projects. So... Um, 
So what we're proposing is the sewer separation plan, which would be done over 40 years, as opposed to the tunnel plan that DEP was previously, that our current uh, consent order is requiring to be done over 14 years. So spending a little bit more, but over a longer period of time. The, uh, so this is an idea uh, showing you what the collection system uh, rehabilitation will look like. So on the right-hand side is the amount of percentage completed to date um, by town. Uh, if you look at uh, Weathersfield, we've completed 32% complete. That was on an earlier slide. 32% uh, of the sewer system has been rehabilitated. With our recommended plan, we're recommending an additional 22% of the sewers in Weathersfield would be rehabilitated for a total of 54%. The right-hand side is the average age of the sewer system. Similar scenario where it's, it's looking at the age of the sewer system before we started, the age of the sewer system, if we didn't do anything with it uh, through our, our, uh, our, our clean water project, and then the age of the sewer system with doing the integrated plan. And so you see that the, the sewer system gets younger with our proposed integrated plan than it would with the tunnel plan. Recommended projects for Weathersfield in the future. Uh, there's uh, in red uh, the circle there. There's it's near old uh, Weathersfield. There's uh, RH2 and RH2B. Those are sub areas where we're going to do uh, II reduction, take infiltration and inflow out of the sewer system. There's a Weathersfield trunk sewer redirection. There's an existing sewer that's going through the wetlands along uh, along the river, and we're looking to take that sewer out of the wetlands and put it into the street on Silas Dean. It actually would connect to the Gough Brook project. Uh, there's a Folly Brook trunk sewer improvements, um, which is down in the northern area uh, of Weathersfield, right near the town line with, uh, with Hartford. And then we'll be doing, like I mentioned, additional sewer rehabilitation throughout the town. So switching gears, how do MDC customers pay for these sewer projects, for the Clean Water Project and CIP? They pay for it in two ways. The CIP Capital improvement projects are paid through the Avalorm, which is assessed to the town and is paid by the, the residents on their tax bill. The clean water project charge is what is, being, what is being used to pay for the clean water project, and that's based on metered water, and the bill shows up on the water bill. What we wanted to do was be able to put both of those together to see what is the resident paying for both of these so we can address the affordability analysis for, uh, for EPA. So looking first at the Avalorm, this is what the average sewer bill would be for uh, a resident in each of the towns in 2019. So for Weathersfield, for instance, we take what the estimated uh, Avalorm would, portion would be to the town. We then divide it by the number of total residential dwelling units, and then you come up with the average dwelling unit of what they pay on the Avalorm side for sewer, which would be $349. Next, we look at the Clean Water Project charge. Uh, and how much, uh, how much residents are paying for that, uh, for the clean water project charge, uh, for the clean water project. And so in this case, uh, we looked at the actual water being consumed in each of the towns. So in the case of Weathersfield, it was 6,700 uh, cubic feet, uh, which is probably about uh, 50 or 60,000 gallons a year. So the average uh, resident in Weathersfield is paying currently $276 on the water bill for the clean water project. So we add those two together, and that's the total bill that residents are paying for sewer. Um, and so for Weathersfield, um, 349 276 it's $625 is the, is the total amount that an average resident is paying for uh, sewer. These numbers are what gets put into the affordability analysis to determine how, you know, the schedule for implementing projects. You see that they range from $460 at low in Hartford to a high in West Hartford of uh, $681. And that's an annual, uh, annual bill. So the summary of the two scenarios, the top one, scenario one, was the all tunnel plan. In this plan, the sewers that I mentioned earlier that are failing or that need to be rehabilitated, they would be done on the CIP through Avalorm. So in scenario one, we have the tunnel project being done, and then in order to address the, the emergency repairs, there's $37 million that's being done on Avalorm through that town bill. Scenario two is the integrated plan that we're looking to move towards, which includes the separation work in North Hartford, but also ex includes a substantial amount of sewer rehabilitation that we're proposing throughout the district as a whole. So in looking at these two side by side, we're comparing household bills 
over the next uh, 40 years. And so what these are is five-year increments. You see two sets of bars. The bar on the left of each set of two bars is if we continued with the current program, we did the North Tunnel, and again, all of the, of the repairs went on Avalorm. And the bar on the right is scenario two, which is the proposed integrated plan. As you can see, uh, as you go in five-year increments, it's nearly the same cost to residents for the two programs. It's actually, it's a little bit cheaper for what we're proposing with scenario two. The major difference between the two is what the projects that are actually being done, there's less sewer rehabilitation that's being done on scenario one because you're building a large tunnel. The tunnel's also getting built sooner. It would have to be built by uh, uh, the early 2030s, as opposed to scenario two, the tunnel's being built uh, starting in the late 30s and being finished in the mid 40s. And then another difference is, is obviously the amount of Avalorum. So the green bar on the bottom is the Avalorum bill, and the blue bars on the top are the Clean Water Project bill. So as you move to the right in five-year increments, you see how much Avalorum would go up if we continued with Scenario 1, which, which is the current plan. Whereas you can see on, the, on the, the right side with the integrated plan, Avalorum does not go up as high, but the Clean Water Project charge on the water bill would be higher. But the end result is the resident would pay about the same. <clears throat> So in going through this process over the last year, we've had uh, uh, dozens, literally dozens of meetings with the MDC, uh, 17 of which were attended by DEEP and, uh, to discuss the integrated plan and to review and rank the projects. Uh, this was presented to the MDC Bureau of Public Works in two different workshops in September and also presented to and approved by the MDC Full District Board on October 1st. Now is where we're at the point where we're going around to all of the town councils to present this, this the new plan. Uh, obviously, we're, I'm here tonight. Um, I'll be busy for the next uh, month going to different places. I think West Hartford just got scheduled for next week, so I have to add that one in. Um, but we're going all around. So then the idea is that we would finalize those three reports uh, for, uh, in, in November. They'd be available for public viewing towards the end of November. We'll have a public hearing either December uh, 11th, 12th, or possibly the 13th now. Uh, and all three volumes would be submitted to DEP on December 31st. Um, so next steps in, in, in why are we here. First, I'd like wanted to inform you on what the MDC is looking to do, inform you on the options. But you know, most importantly, we're looking for uh, the town and the residents' support as we go forward uh, with presenting this to DEP. Um, if you have any questions, of course, I'll take them. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, or letters of support after I leave, uh, you certainly can uh, email them to the district clerk at the email address uh, that you see here. So at this point, I'll okay. open it up to questions. Thank you. Are there any counselors who have questions this evening? Councilor Hurley. I do. Um, hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, you talked about the affordability analysis. Is that, gonna, is that done with the towns, or how does that work? So the affordability analysis is done in, if you look at the MDC as a whole, it averages all eight towns. Um, EPA uses a metric that says 2% of the median household income, is con if, any, if it's less than that, it is considered affordable. So when you look at the, all the eight MDC towns together for their median household income, we don't approach the 2% level. In Weathersfield, uh, uh, um, probably in the low 1% range, probably half, maybe a little bit more than half of what EPA says that residents could afford. But when you look specifically at Hartford, which DEP and EPA allow you to do, they are right at the 2% of the median household income. So we use the city of Hartford to show how much can be afforded to do in this program. Uh, which isn't presented here, but that's how we developed the 40-year schedule. Um, my other question is on page 22. So from 2020 to 2025, if you take scenario two, it looks like you're going up 72 percent. Which one, the first one? First one. <clears throat> Scenario two of 2020. Oh, right. It should be 583. That's a typo. Sorry. I mean, that's still a pretty significant increase, correct? No, that's, that's 2020. So it's five. It would be 593 if we continued on the current plan. With the integrated plan, it should be about 
583. And that's an average of all customers. You're talking about the increase in the next five years, right? The increase in the next five years, because the last time you were here, I think our last budget was up a little over 10%, projected again to be a little over 10%, and it doesn't look like it's going to start coming down anytime soon. Right. Yeah, it's still 43%. What is going up primarily is the clean water project charge on the water bill. No, I get that, but you were talking about affordability analysis, which I really didn't totally understand because the rates still continue to go up for the for both the town that gets charged um, that we have to pass off to the taxpayers plus their own bills. Yeah, if we what you're saying is there a scenario that holds the the residential bills at the say six hundred dollars a year projected for 2020 something closer to that right and well no i mean just the we have increases in the town but the mdc seems to be like increasing um five or six times what the town has to increase on a lot of our expenses i i i'm the middle person between the hartford mdc and dep if if, if, if dep was here today they would tell you that the mdc should be spending double they've spent one point you know five billion dollars in the last decade and if they were here today they'd tell you it's not enough how come you're not done what i'm saying is that instead of us spending that billion dollars over the next decade that we try to push it out and we try to prioritize spending it on the collection system but for me to put a plan forward as you're suggesting to dep that says we basically would be doing nothing we'd just be paying off debt um I, it would be unacceptable to the state Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Councilman Martina? Is there any scenario where municipalities can waive doing this at such a rate? I would welcome letters to DEP saying that we think that the MDC's plan that they put forward is too much. <laughs> Until they're going to be pushing back saying it's not enough. And I know I, I hear you guys' concern, uh, and I understand it. Um, we were looking to put forward a plan that that was reasonable for addressing the collection system. What we think is reasonable for addressing combined sewer overflows uh, over over this period of 40 years. It seems like the schedule that the EPA <clears throat> is asking you to achieve is very aggressive, and for taxpayers who can't afford that. I could see a lot of towns being in the same situation where they're going to end up having to bond for something like this, if that's even possible. The current schedule for the MDC to complete the Clean Water Project by consent order is 2029, which is 11 years from now. We're proposing to push that out to 40 years from now. So we're going to be submitting a document to DEP that's asking for a 30-year extension. I think that... It, we're trying to do exactly what you guys are asking us to do. We're trying to do that. We're not putting a plan in that says we're still going to do this in 11 years and we're going to continue to do it as fast as we can and spend another billion. We're trying to do that, but it's still the rates are going to go up because we still need to do projects. I, Just so I understand <clears throat> it, is the 625 that you are proposing per year for sewer and clean water per household, that is in addition to the 483 or the 583, whatever your typo was, or is that separate? No, it's included. Oh. The, the 583 is included. It includes the clean water charge in 2020, which is, which is estimated to be 323 on average, and the Avalorum charge, which is estimated for the residents to be $280. So what's the 625? Well, that was if you just looked at Weathersfield. So this, the other graph is looking at the MD, all MDC towns together. Combined. This okay. is just looking at Weathersfield. So the average person living in our town would be paying 625 a year to get this done, plus whatever the town has to pass off because we pay the ad valorem? It's included. I'm confused. Ad valorem is in there. It's the green bar. So it's 625 a year per household? Correct. For both Avalorm and the Clean Water Project charge, yes. Okay. This one, I mean, this is looking at each town individually. 
if I did this for each town individually, I'd need eight slides or I'd have eight stacks of bars. So this is just looking at the average of all the MDC towns. So if I go back to this other slide, you know, the average is probably somewhere around, actually it is at the end here, the average is 540. So the average of all MDC towns for residents of what they're paying is 540. That in 2020 would go to an average of about 583. On the subject of the DEP, and this is kind of off topic, and it's just, what's the status of the, is there a lawsuit that's going on right now with the um, Windsor uh, trash uh, landfill and the runoff? How is that right now? If we were talking about DEP earlier, just to get a, an idea. Because if, if there the NDC is. is successful, we would see uh, hopefully a decrease that would be a credit to the Avalorum, correct? I, I think, is it now, is it $4 million, the lawsuit? It's, it's about, about $4 million a year. 4.3. 4.3. Yeah. Million a year. Mm -hmm. So that would be a reduction to the Avalorum if they paid what they owe related mm -hmm. to that. Would we so, see that in the, tw if it's settled before 2020, would we see that in the, Scenario two, 2020, 260 figures? Yes. What would that drop us down? Wasn't it like, yeah, wasn't it five oh. or six percent, something like that? It would drop not, it by about six percent. Not meaningful. Not, I mean, we wouldn't see. Well, because it, it's getting it's spread, spread over out. all eight towns. Right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the other question I had was on slide 18, I believe. It was the 349 figure, the, and that's residential. Is there a cost to commercial real, real uh, commercial property at all for an ad valorem tax? Yes. Do they pay? Do the commercial res, residents pay a different? Do they pay? They pay ad valorem. Do they also pay the sewer fee as well? The commercial they pay on the water bill for whatever water they use, just like anybody, they pay the same rate. Well, the, yeah, cool. John Zinzarella of the MDC. Um, commercial entities. Speak into the microphone. Please. Commercial entities, such as if they have um, cons water consumption in excess of 12,000 CCFs a year, they're, they're also taxed the sewer user charge. So that's that's how it's a modified ad valorem. So because as it is right now, they're they're paying property taxes in the eight member towns. So part of the base sewer cost is assessed to them through their property taxes. But um, back in nineteen the nineteen eighties, EPA required to be out of fairness, a two million dollar residence may not be using the same amount of water as a two million dollar manufacturing entity. So the high flow um, charge um, equates it. Okay. So that. That tells us then that Hartford pays, has more units, but pays less in the ad valorem compared to a less Weathersfield assessment. Yeah, the, 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 what comes into place in Hartford, obviously there's, there's a, a preponderance of multifamily units, and this is using median uh, household income. The other f uh, function that plays into this is in most of the towns, in the seven of the eight member towns, uh, when you're determining your assessed value, you're taking your market rate and multiplying it by 70%. For Hartford in single family resident or in residential properties, it's only 32% or so of the, of the market value. So that's what skews the, num the numbers a little bit. How, how do we get Weathersfield's numbers of 349? We're second only to West Hartford. West Hartford's population is more than double than ours. We are well, you know, Rocky Hills less than ours, but they pay substantially less than us. It doesn't look by, you know, percentage, just, you know, looking at it off the top of my head. But then you've got Bloomfield with almost the same number as Rocky Hill, but they pay more than the 270. Yeah, the, the, 
this, those calculations there in the right column are based upon the housing inventory in each of the towns relative to the assessed values as well as the number of residential dwelling units. So it's the residential dwelling units are from the American Community Survey from the, American, from the U.S. Census, and the, the assessed uh, values of the houses are based upon the uh, tax assessor list. So you basically... So the more, the more successful a town is with their property values, correct. the more they get hit with a higher ad valorem tax. That's correct. correct. Interesting. Okay. Councilor Lester, we uh, if I may, uh, we were focused on the on the Avalorm charge. The other side of the equation is the Clean Water Project charge, which is the amount of water that is actually being consumed. So in this case, Hartford is on the higher end of the scale. Actually, they're the highest. Um, and so then we're adding those two together. Okay. And with Scenario One. More is going towards Avalorm. With scenario two, less is going towards Avalorm, and more is going on the Clean Water Project charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thus advocating for scenario two more than scenario one, from your point of view. Scenario two has a lot of benefits to it, one of which is to, to put it on the Clean Water Project charge to address those projects that have the dual benefits, which reduces the amount that would be on Avalorm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, most of my questions have been answered, and it's been a little bit of a challenge to follow all this, but I, but I appreciate your presentation. But I did want to follow up on Councillor Hurley's question, which I think it's either, I think it's slide 20 or 22, if you could, yeah. Um, next one. Yeah, this one, which was the more significant increase uh, between 2020 and 2025 as opposed to other five-year increments, it's substantially higher. I think that's kind of what you were getting at. And I wasn't sure, you know, we talked about that the, the, in 2020 the number was off. It should be 583, but I don't think, uh, or maybe I didn't hear you address why the, that, in the, that first five-year increment there's such a difference in uh, increase as opposed to other five-year increments. It's a lot of that has to do with the way the clean water charge has to ramp up in order to generate enough money to pay for the future tunnel in the 2030s and all of the work. So it actually has to ramp up ahead of time to generate so, that amount of money to build the tunnel later. So if I hear you right, there's more upfront cost in, in, in doing that it, in the first five years. Is that is If that I was showing you the clean water project charge, the way we have it, the way that it shows these numbers, it goes up and then it plateaus and it stays where it is. So it, I think it takes maybe a decade for it to go up, something like that, and then it plateaus. It doesn't go up, you know, the same over the entire 40 years. It goes up for 10 years and then plateau, plateaus at the same rate for the next 30. But it's almost like, if you will, ramp up costs is why it's higher in the first five year increment. Is that, Correct. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Councilor Forrest. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my questions are a little bit uh, not on those slides. <laughs> um, do you alert Weathersfield when there is um, an overflow into the Weathersfield Cove, which I'm assuming is the still the overflow valve still is functional? Yes. Right. I mean, if any overflow occurs, you would get notified. The um, the South Tunnel project that I mentioned earlier, when that is complete at the end of 2023, those will no longer occur. That will completely eliminate any overflows to Weathersfield Cove. No matter how heavy the rainstorm? Through, correct. It will not overflow. The, the overflows will be brick and mortared. So will that, will that outlet then be removed? Into the Weathersfield Cove, which as we know is near the railroad tracks? There would still be, there's still drainage that may be in that outfall. So I don't know if the outfall would be removed or if there's still local drainage that's in it that still would go to the cove. By local drainage, you mean sewer? Uh, no, storm it would be sewer? Storm, storm water. Storm water would go in there. Right. It would not be sewer. Is there a way to just get us what the, your detailed proposal is under scenario two as far as the overflows into Weathersfield Cove and what you're anticipated, what pipes are anticipated to go in there? And if that sewer, particularly the sewer pipe, is considered, is, uh, is going to be removed? Both scenarios include completely eliminating overflows to Weathersfield Cove by the end of 2023. That's 
That's that's the South Tunnel project that's under construction now will achieve that. That both scenarios include that. There will be no more overflows to Weathersfield Cove in 2024. Of currently of the 464 million that is overflowed, how much of that does go into the cove? Approximately, obviously, I'm not asking for a gallon. Do you, do you know? So. The Franklin Avenue CSOs are what currently goes into the Cove. So in 2004, we didn't have data for it. But in 2009, there was 111 million gallons that was estimated to go there. Uh, today, there's 40. So there's been a substantial reduction from 111 to 40 to where we are today. And then once the tunnel goes online, that will go to zero. The um, Middletown Avenue, what we call the Middletown Avenue construction project, but that's the pipe, obviously, that goes on the south side of our town and into Rocky Hill. Um, that project's obviously been going on a while. There was just two concerns that I think I've heard from residents on a fairly regular basis, and that also includes a lot of the sewer lining that you're doing in Old Weathersfield, and I'm sure at other parts, and that is just communication with the residents. So obviously those residents have been struggling down there, and the detour's been for, there for quite a while, and it's pushing on over a year now and so on and so forth. If it is possible, and I understand construction doesn't run on nice tight time schedules as we might like, but some type of expectation where uh, the homeowner, the resident that's going through this project just as you are, uh, it would be very helpful to them. And if there is some type of an idea where, hey, we're looking at opening up this detour in six months, eight months, nine months, um, would be very helpful for, to those residents if you could do a little bit more education, whether that's on Facebook or direct mail. Um, there has been there have been a lot of questions that have come to the leadership here, and I'm sure just general banter around all these neighborhoods that have all these linings and roads being t t taken up about when is the truck going to come through, when is the milling going to happen, when is the overlay, and it's um, it's helpful for them just to know. It's they all understand. Everybody here understands that we're getting new pipes and it's important and it's water, the basis of our civilization. <laughs> But, uh, but informing them is key, and I don't, it doesn't sound like there's that general knowledge about people that are pretty much well in the know of you know, Weathersfield society. Is there, is there something you could say, speak to that as far as being able to inform the residents? Yeah, I mean, six months would be, it would, Jason Waterbury with the MDC. Um, would you just months, tell us your name, sir? Oh, Jason Waterbury with the MDC. Thank you. Uh, six months would be a bit of a challenge to predict uh, for construction detour in some cases. Um, we try to get it out at least a month in advance as far as, you know, predicting detours. I know we did just recently send a flyer out giving residents an update on the construction of Middletown Ave and Mill. Uh, we expect the Middletown Mill intersection to be reopened in November. Um, following that, sh shortly following after that, we will be detouring westbound uh, Mill Street um, by Silestine Highway, that you would only be able to go east on Mill between Silestine and, and Middletown Ave. Um, we're doing that in lieu of excavating across Silestine Highway, which would have been uh, a much bigger impact to the, the neighborhood and uh, the businesses. But as far as the communication itself, we do try to give updates. Um, I think in general, for the course of the project, we've done an update every one to two months as a flyer, just as of what progress they've seen to date. Okay. I, I just encourage you. I don't. Know, I don't know. Maybe there's some maybe loss of communication, or people are using social media more, and maybe they're throwing away the flyers because they think it's an advertisement. I couldn't say, but um, that type of expectation about when things are going to come back online or when things are going offline. Mm -hmm. and that also includes when we do, when you do, you know, sewer main go throughs. I mean, I'm thinking about old, old Weathersfield is all has been a mess for a long time, and I think and those residents are just anxious to get information even if it's an understanding that it's going to be six more months. So just if you could please be mindful and guessing that that happens in other towns as well. I don't think Weathersfield's unique in that manner, but that that information that, and even if there's some type of an estimated timeline where the uh, residents can understand when they could sort of expect the improvement after the construction. Thank you. And um, on sort of on that note also, whether it's, I'm not necessarily saying it's MDC, but probably the subcontractors that are building these things are the contractors. When we, especially with the detour with Middletown Ave, there is a lot of uh, construction trucks that are parked in relatively dangerous areas as people are still trying to get e 
egress to their houses. So they'd be parked on corners and cars would have to come around corners but not be able to see around the corner. And a lot of those large commercial vehicles throughout Wethersfield, but I've heard a lot of issues or concerns in the Middletown Avenue particular construction project. If you could help monitor where people are parking so that everyone can get to and from their house in a safe manner, it has been sort of an ongoing problem with people or contractors that you're using uh, parking in dangerous areas so that the flow of traffic that still does exist can get there safely. I did hear a similar comment from a resident before the meeting and I will make sure that gets relayed to our field staff. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions from council? Councilor Rell. Just a follow up and thank you for the second time. I had heard uh, some concerns a while back, I think it was over the summer, about a change in the billing program for the MDC from a 12 month period to a 14 month or 30 days down to 25 day billing periods. Have you guys implemented that yet? Quarterly to monthly, right? Okay. Um, there's, there's some misinformation out there. Uh, in 2017, um, the MDC went from quarterly billing to monthly billing. And the uh, ordinance that it, for the water, uh, water ordinance said is that those quarterly bills were due in 30 days. So when you go to monthly billings, what was happening was is that as, as I'm a customer of the MDC, as I get my next month's bill, it's not reflecting the payment from the previous because it's a 30-day payment cycle. So what we did was we re researched what other entities are doing, um, and you look at your credit card bills, uh, you look at Eversource, it's a 25-day payment cycle. So that what we did was we changed the water payment ordinance from 30 days to 25 days. It was a public hearing and it was approved. So there's still monthly billing, but instead of having 30 days to pay, it's down to 25 so that the payment, the customer's payments reflected on the next month's bill if they're paying on time. Still 12 payments, still 12 still invoices. Still 12 payments. Still 12, 12 invoices a year. Okay. So this probably explains that every time that I hit on line pay on due date, <laughs> I push it all the way off to the last day, let as much yep. money accrue interest as possible. Um, in the state, you need to accrue as much as possible. Um, so that when I pay that bill next month, instead of, you know, typically I have like a $70 monthly bill, I get a bill for $40, $140. Yep. It's because that $70 that was paid was after that 25 day right. period. So if you're on the 15th of the month, if, you're, if your billing cycle was cutting a bill on the 15th, under the 30 day, it was due the next month on the 15th. So the bill, the new bill would cut and then the cash application would come in on the same day and apply. So it wouldn't see there. So now you basically is if your bill is billing date is the 15th, the payment due date is the 10th of the, of the next month. So therefore the money will, you'll pay your bill on the 10th mm -hmm. and then it will be reflected when we cut the next invoice. Gotcha. Okay. Just to allay any fears though, nobody's paying 14 <laughs> bills next no. month, uh, next year. You know, 12, extra monthly. two more fees or anything no, like that. It's a monthly, 12 monthly bills a year. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank we you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Um, we're sending out two corrections to your um, agenda for the appointments tonight. And these were the ones that you have you right. previously yep. emailed to us yes. um, on Friday. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we have no hearings tonight. Our next order of business will be public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. Please um, state your name and address. Uh, when you come up to the microphone, and please talk right into the microphone. Mr. Hickey, did you want to come up and speak, please? <clears throat> uh, good evening. 
Madam Mayor, members, members of the Town Council, uh, speaking as a retired state land planner and as a veteran of some 30-odd uh, years experience on town boards and commissions dealing with land and natural resource issues, I wish to support Wethersfield's proposed acquisition of the Keisha Farm for open space. In my, in my opinion, this is the most appropriate future use of this property. The basic fact here is that the Keisha Farm as an entity is, is ending, and it's either going to be developed for housing, or it's going to be used for one or more open space uses. If one's sole motivation is fiscal or tax income, you should recognize the residential housing will be a net loss to the town because of the cost of services versus the amount of tax, tax revenue you, you're going to get. And on the other hand, if one is willing to consider other potential uses which the town, which the farm offers the town, Possible options include, number one, ball fields, as some people already have, have, have proposed, especially for youth sports. You need areas with good, non-stony, well-drained, and basically level soils, which occupy part of the farm, in which I think you'd be hard-pressed to find elsewhere in the town at this late date. Second would be active use for, for, for agriculture. Two possibilities. Interim agricultural use on, on, an, inter, on an interim basis uh, pending possible ball field development. Or another pet interest of mine, possible community garden plots for interested citizens. You've got good soil would be ideal for, for gardening. Uh, lastly, again, a pet interest of mine, wildlife habit preservation. In a largely developed town, especially in wooded and wetland portions of the farm and serving as passive open space. Also, this is really my pet interest, a possibility. The preservation of the Keisha farm would ensure completion of a continuous wildlife migration corridor, uh, stretching from almost uh, Crest State in the north all the way down to and including the High Crest property. <clears throat> In closing, I would like to add that the act that the, ask that the town act while this opportunity still remains, and thus allowing the town to plan what and where specific open space uses could be best appropriate on this piece of land. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. Anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up. I'll have you come up right after them. Hi, guys. Can everybody see me? Tony <laughs> Costanzo, same size sitting down as I am standing up. Um, my wife, Tara Costanzo. What we are here for, do you want me to speak? First? Go ahead. Uh, what yeah. we're here to do is actually also support um, the town's purchase of Keecher's Farm as well. Uh, we have about four minutes left on a sitter for our two year old, so I'm going to second just about everything that you said, but I'm going to add to it in the sense that my wife and I um, are the, we bought the home that um, is right at the top of that chart. I don't have a diagram and I'm not nearly as prepared as you are, but if you go down 92 uh, Collier Road, we are 92. We're the house that butts up against the farmland. So one of the things that drew us to this property in the first place was the fact that it is somewhat of an open space and we have you know a two-year-old and we love the wildlife we love you know what we see there I mean we have turkeys the other day there was a bobcat if you can believe that <laughs> um, so in essence um, you know when we first started this process I was in favor of a developer buying the property because I was misinformed and I was not aware until we went to a couple of different meetings and learned more about tax revenue that would be collected um, versus the amount of dollars that would go out. And I found uh, quickly that it's in the best interest of the town to purchase this land, and we hope that that actually does happen. So that's what we're here to say, and if there's anything else you'd like well, to Well, we add. know everybody has their ideas of what they'd like the, the land to actually be developed, and I think 
after meeting with some of the council members and meeting with and talking to people that live on Collier Road, we really truly believe that once we purchase the land, we can come together and make a really great decision of what's going to actually happen on that property. And I think it could be a little bit for everyone. But the first thing we need to do is purchase the property and then we can come together as a community and figure out how we're going to make this last open space really wonderful for everyone in the community. So we hope you vote yes on Election Day. So thank you. Thank you, Thank guys. you. Come on up. Um, my name is Carmen Sayas. I live at Fallybrook Apartments. Um, just before I speak about this, that, that sounds like a really good idea. I hope the town does buy the land. Um, I'm, I'm nervous, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm here because uh, this year my dog got run over by a car, and you're like, she's here because her dog got run over by a car. No, I'm here because it could have been my child that would have ran after the dog. My son has mild autism, and my dog got run over by the car. Lucky the dog was running fast, and, um... Five days later, another dog got run over a couple yards from where my dog got run over. My dog didn't make it. And it got me thinking I should ask if we have a speeding problem. I've lived in Follybrook for 17 years since I was 23 and I'm 40. And I have four children. One that graduated Wethersfield High School last year. She's at UConn now. And um, three other beautiful children. And um, my thing is that um, when the uh, the police department did an independent study, um, they did three, and I gave them all the copies of the stuff that they came up with. They found that we had a really bad speeding problem. I don't know how to read the charts, but it was like it's like s compared to Parkview Drive, Morrison, and M M Mullen Avenue. Um, it's like for within the limit, 20% of our drivers were within the limit. For the other ones, it was their drivers were 70, 63, and 54%, and we're 25 miles an hour. For going tolerable 35 miles an hour or more, um, our street was 80, 79% of the drivers were going past 35 miles per hour. And then, I mean, within the 10% of, within going to 10% of after 25 miles per hour, but 21% of the drivers um, are going over 35 miles an hour, more like 70. Because what happened is there's a street behind our street on Hubbard um, near Goodwin Park, and that's the street behind, and they put speed bumps. So now everybody's trying to avoid their speed bumps, so they're really going down Follybrook. And what happens is they're also trying to race to the turnpike, and since there's no stops, you know, there's a stop sign, and it's like almost a half mile until the first light on Jordan Lane. So we're only talking about the apartments of Follybrook. There's 184 units, 184 apartments where I live. That's 184 families that have more than one person or two bedroom apartments. And um, there's 12 buses for the kids um, in my street alone, just in front of the apartments. And they come twice a day. That's 24 bus stops, not including the city buses or the 184 people that, you know, or more that live there, 80, 184 units. And since the percentage to the 21% compared to the Parkview, Morrison, and McMullen Avenue is 2%, 5%, 9%. So 21% is a big difference. And it's a real bad situation because there's lots of kids, there's elderly, everybody walks dogs, it's a dog friendly neighborhood. Um, and the speeding's gotten worse. So they went and they did something to the street where they put a line and for the parking. It used to be where the street didn't have a line. Now there's a line so that the people could park, and now the thing got more narrow. So when they did that, it actually got worse. The police said they can't put people to take away, um, to give tickets all the time. 
And that wouldn't be a good long-term solution. It would take resources from the town that you guys need, you know, like all of us, to have them free. And then the other thing would be they can't um, put signs up that say kids that play or slow down because there's against the law, and I have it in their thing. It's against the law to put those signs up. So the only solution that um, they didn't want was on speed bumps. If it was permanent, that makes sense because the town hasn't had permanent. So we came up with a better idea. Temper the ones that aren't permanent, the ones that cost like a thousand to thirteen hundred, and you take them off, and you could if it doesn't work out, you you know you don't use it. But if it works out and it deters calming traffic, it can make all the difference in trying to prevent car accidents, um, a little kids getting run over, the elderly. Um, it's a lot of problems that could come from, you know, this situation. And my dog, you know, I loved him, but I didn't do this because of my dog. It, well, he represented that my son could have ran after him and it would have been my son they come to tell me my dog got run over. So if it would have been my son, it could have been anybody's kid or anybody's family member. And I'm just trying to um, make it safer there and a more reasonable thing where it doesn't cost a lot. It's not permanent. It can be removed for, like, snow or, or like, you know, different things. But, um, yeah, that's what I came to say. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Jack, come on up. Hi, uh, Jack Breton, 209 Clovercrest Road. Uh, I'm here speaking tonight in support of the uh, Keisha Farm land purchase. I, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of the reasons why. Um, it's the last large piece of developable, developable land uh, near Highcrest School. It comprises wetlands, wooded area, uh, and open space that could be beneficial to the town. Um, I think the main thing here, the main opportunity for the town would be the sports fields, like we've all been talking about. There's opportunity for baseball fields, soccer fields, lacrosse fields. Uh, speaking to individuals uh, involved with the youth sports program and uh, have, being part of that same program when I was growing up, uh, there are, there's a known problem of shortage of fields within the program, and that's only going to get worse with the uh, advent of more sports, including lacrosse. Um, which has grown to, you know, be all ages now. So uh, that's that's the main opportunity for the for the development of this land. But um, there's other opportunities, including you know, the wetlands that are within uh, this parcel of land. Sixteen percent are wetlands. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to develop, but the reason why these are good is because they one they support and protect local wildlife. But on top of that. They, um, they actually help drainage. They uh, store and temporary, uh, they temporarily store, and they uh, slowly release rainwater uh, into our sewer system, which I'm sure uh, the folks at the MDC can attest to. Um, that would be good. And you know, obviously, the cost of this thing, uh, it's high. It's not high for land like this, but sp you know, split out. Everyone's taxes, you know, it will go down as years go by. I think it's something that uh, would definitely be beneficial, even for the price. Um, I think the biggest thing that, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people that are going to come up here tonight, and they're going to talk about there's no plan. Uh, there's no plan. There's no plan. There's uh, misinformation about it being rushed. Um, we're just buying it now to buy it. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of time to sit back and make an, a genuine plan for the land and the sports fields and where they're going to go and the cost. But the thing is, is that it's, you know, it's a piece of land. It's, if we don't buy it, it's going to go for sale. We have to jump on it. If we buy it, then we can take it and we can plan out the land. We can plan out what we're going to do with it. Um, resident input will take into account costs. If, um, you could take into account uh, people living around the area, if they do want sports fields or not, uh, the cost of the fields, everything like that. 
Um, you know, studies will take place regarding the usability and the feasibility of various developments within the land. Um, and, yeah, that's, uh, I think, I, I just think the big misinformation is that, you know, it's being rushed through because it can be. It's, you know, we're just doing it because that's, you know, that's why. But the big thing is that it's, it's, uh, it's, there will, there will be planning to be done. It's just, it's, unfortunately, the time, it has, it's, it's a time sensitive issue. It has to be purchased. And that's, that's why we're doing it now. And that's why there's a little, um, rush to it. So overall, you know, this purchase is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to take a piece of land unique to the town of Weathersfield and develop it into a multi-recreational use property that would have many uses, benefits, and opportunities for the residents of the town. Um, and I think, you know, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I think we should all jump on it and vote yes. So. Thank you. Yep. Is there anybody no else who'd like to speak? Stephanie, come on up. Uh, Stephanie Zapaka, um, 444 Middletown Avenue. I wasn't planning on speaking, but it was so nice to hear Mr. Forrest actually speak for the residents of Middletown Ave. Uh, I live on the corner of Middletown and Casey Lane, which is Kuwait at this point. It's a war zone. It's gone well beyond the scope of what we originally were told the project was going to be. The noise is unreasonable. There are cars that are zooming and starting up their engines at 6.40 in the morning. Um, they go till 5, 5.30. Uh, visitors no longer want to come to my neighborhood or visit. People that want to deliver items uh, come to my door aghast with the um, amount of time it takes them to get through the war zone uh, that I'm currently living in. The wait time to get to work and to come home has increased significantly. My son's uh, program has complained because of the wait time um, as well. So for those of us that are living in this area where we can't raise our windows anymore because of the dirt, um, the noise, the grinding, the assault on our homes, it's beyond bearable at this point. I have a special needs son who's 27 who has special needs and no regard for anyone, I believe, that's living in this neighborhood to date. And these notes that we get uh, with updates are nearly not specific enough. Uh, we get them probably every two months, and they say we'll, com we'll be completed by the spring. We'll be completed by the end of the winter. We'll com be completed during the winter. Winter goes for five months. When specifically are we talking? So the assault on our neighborhood uh, really is uh, beyond the scope. We are not um, enjoying, uh, as somebody said in an article, um, a, a good quality of life. We are part of Old Weathersfield. We are the tail end of the historical district. As we, about 10 paces away from Rocky Hill, we are forgotten. I feel like we are the misfits of Weathersfield. And nobody, at least I thought, cared. So thank you for speaking up for the residents, because I am on the corner, and I live through it every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak, sir? Come on up. Thank you. My name is Bob Woodward. I am Stephanie's immediate neighbor at 456 Middletown Avenue. My nickname for it is not a war zone. It's nightmare on Middletown Avenue. I expressed that last year at the budget hearing. Uh, I, my other neighbor, Natalie, and I had a con chance to have a conversation with Jason. I think he heard more than he was prepared to hear tonight. There is still construction to go across from our house and Natalie's house. 
It shouldn't take long, but as Stephanie said, it will be noisy. We have issues getting mail because some of the mailboxes are blocked. We have learned to put barrels together because they can't block my driveway. We have learned, and the mail person, legal or not, I finally convinced him to leave mail in my mailbox for the two boxes across the street. We have banded together. It has not been easy. Thank you, Mr. Forrest, for your support. But I would go a step further than Stephanie. I would invite any of you to come down to the neighborhood, and Stephanie or I or Natalie or someone will walk you around, and you can see what's going on. I do feel a distinct lack of support from the town. I feel like we're out there on our own. Um, dealing with this. The workers are nice, but they bring their vehicles in, which creates parking problems sometimes, and I had a conversation about that tonight. It has added traffic to the neighborhood that we did not expect, uh, as well as the construction vehicles, which I guess we expected. Um, the noise of when they move the crane, the big cranes with the tr uh, tank treads on them, is uh, is interesting in the morning. I know when they're doing that, to say the least. But um, as I said, the workers are nice, they have a job to do, and I think they've forgotten that they're living in a neighborhood. One of the supervisors tried to tell my wife we're a construction zone. My take is no, we're a neighborhood, and they are our guests, and they should treat us the way they would want to be treated if we were the contractor in their neighborhood. If we are only a construction zone, then please send the rest of my tax bills to MDC. We shouldn't be paying taxes if we're not a neighborhood anymore. And I seriously mean that. Please come down and walk around the neighborhood and let us and learn some things about what's going on there. This is your town. Thank you, sir. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Sir, in the back. Um, Nick DeSenza. I'm on 24 caliber lane. <clears throat> um, I'm also here for parking issues and things of that sort, but uh, the real issues, and I don't know if this has come up in a town council meeting yet, is uh, Harvey Fuller Field has essentially no parking on it. There's a little bit of parking on the side of it, so Caliber Lane and Valley Crest have become the parking for the town. Um, they park on both sides of the streets. They overhang the driveways. I had my car hit last week. It's My front yard is essentially a playground for everybody's random kids as they're unloading and unloading in my front yard. This isn't once a week. I understand people want to see their kids and eat the park. This is minimum five days a week, six months a year. And uh, again, I challenge someone to come down and check this out and see if a first responder can actually make it up that street when they're double parked all the way up it. Because there's an even bigger problem if something happens that, God forbid, someone gets hurt or dies and fire trucks can't get there. Um, like I said, I understand that um, people need parking. They want to see their kids, fortunately, or hopefully one day those will be my kids and I'll be able to watch them. I guess the solution is what they did on Palmer Drive. Um, they put parking on one side of the street. I mean, I had work going on at my house. I had shrubs being planted. I had to work my schedule around when there was going to be soccer games. I had to take time off from work because my landscaper couldn't get a truck in my driveway to deliver trees. I, you know, I don't think any resident should have to go through that. I don't think it's asking too much to at least restrict the parking so people can get in and out of their driveways. Simple as that. I mean, it's, like I said, it's an ongoing thing. There's been a number of burglaries in the area. I, my car's been burgled three times. I was in an accident two weeks ago when this guy hit it. And the same week as the burglary, I had an armed foot pursuit in my front yard, which Weather Show PD and state police were in. So you can understand why I don't want random people walking in the yards and all over the place because things go missing. So, so thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Sir, come on. My name is uh, Todd Lebrecht. I live at uh, 18 Caliber Lane. I'm here with my wife, Lori, tonight. And kind of backing up what Nick had to say, um, yeah, it's just it's getting ridiculous where there are times where our driveway has been partially blocked a number of times where we've had to call the police. Uh, they're very understanding, and they say they know there's a real issue there. Uh, a couple of months back, my next-door neighbor, I felt terrible for his daughter, she uh, was getting ready to go to work, comes out, and the parents weren't home, so I kind of got involved. We called the cops. But somebody literally had parked blocking the whole driveway, so she couldn't even get out of the driveway. Um, and it's just, you know, there are times where, like, I'll go to 
bring out my uh, trash or my recycling and I can't even get it on the street because it's just wall-to-wall -wall cars. Uh, I've noticed lately also too, like a lot of trash is being thrown on people's lawns and whatnot. Um, and here again, I, you know, I played sports a lot growing up. I, you know, earlier they're talking about getting, uh, buying some land for ball fields and whatnot. I think that's great, but you got to think of the parking though. There's no parking there. And I also think there's a public safety side of this as well. I mean, I've noticed lately there are a number of times where you've got kids darting in and out of traffic coming both down Caliber Lane and Palmer Drive. And the tough thing is where you have just like bumper to bumper parking on both sides. I've witnessed a couple times where there have been cars either coming around Caliber Lane onto Palmer or vice versa. And they almost collide into each other because they don't even see each other because of all the cars parked. And when they finally get to that turn, there's not enough space for two lanes of traffic. So it's kind of like that abrupt stop and like, oh, who's going to go where? Um, and then it's such a mad dash for those lucrative parking uh, areas on the street that it gets kind of crazy where I've seen people barreling down the street trying to you know, get to that parking spot. I've seen a couple of people uh, almost hit people or other cars trying to back up and, and it's, it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, and as Nick said, you know, you wonder, God forbid, if there was ever an emergency or a fire truck had to get down there when there's a soccer game or a flag football game going on. Um, not good. So, you know, as I said, I mean, I know the police have been out there a number of times. They've been very uh, understanding. They're always like, it's a problem, but you guys need to go to, you know, town hall meeting and kind of let them know. Um, so hopefully, you know, it's something that kind of gets looked at. Um, and I guess I'll just leave you with this. I mean, one thing that kind of, uh, from time to time, I kind of shake my head. I'm like, we've been there, what, six, seven years, but I'm like, you build these nice ball fields, but you didn't build any, nobody built any parking. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it just seems like over the last few years, it's even getting worse. And I say it's getting worse because on one hand, you know, you built the ball fields and it's good because more people are getting involved in the sports and playing the sports, but it just means more traffic and there's no place for these people to park. But uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you. Rick Dorn, 223 Main Street. Uh, tonight, I come before the council, our neighbors, and uh, those watching on TV as the representative and spokesperson for the Great Meadows Conservation Trust. As the 50-year uh, stalwart leader in preservation in Weathersfield, uh, we wish to uh, express as the uh, on behalf of the president, the officers, and the board of directors, that the Great Meadows Land Trust fully supports the proposed acquisition of the Keisha Farm. We think that the highest and best use of the land is in its form of agriculture or passive recreation with a plan in the future that would satisfy all, including perhaps mitigating some of the parking issues up on Highland Street uh, when games are played across the street at the Highcrest uh, facilities. <coughs> it's a lot of planning that will take place in the future, but our organization has oftentimes uh, tried to be an advocate uh, for preservation where it's appropriate and necessary. Years ago, we were first to uh, step up and, and uh, actually support the Wilkes Farm acquisition here in town. And additionally, it's not uncommon for us to look up land in other towns where we do our work in Glastonbury and in Rocky Hill, and we have supported uh, efforts up land in Glastonbury, seven, eight miles from the Connecticut River. So we recognize, the, as other speakers have said, the value of the, the water, and the water quality, the recharging of water, its proper uh, drainage, and, uh, and also the wildlife habitat that exists there. And the best use would be for, as we see it, passive recreation, 
uh, as well as uh, any type of ball fields that might be planned in the future. In closing, I think the costs amortized over the years are finite. Yes, it's going to cost money, but we'll know what those costs are. If the land is developed, the cost will continue. If it's residential housing for families or for senior housing, the costs will not cease. But with this plan, it will give us a chance to plan for the payment and the final use of the land in its highest and best use. I know that the, uh, the Federal Department of Agriculture deems a lot of the land as being what they call prime soils, the highest rated soils, so the agricultural potential there still exists and we would certainly advocate that. So finally, I want to urge all of our fellow citizens to vote yes on referendum question number three and support the town acquisition of the Keisha Farm. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up in the back. Katie Sullivan, 79 Wright Road in Weathersfield, and I also would like to speak in support of the Keisha Farm acquisition. Um, you know, it's been, all of the reasons have been mentioned, uh, the increase in, in the need for town services if the land were developed. I keep hearing people complaining about roads not being repaired. Well, let's just add some more roads then, <laughs> and that'll just add to, you know, the time that it's gonna take to go and get your road repaired. Um, more students in the schools. Highcrest is already bursting at the seams. Um, so then you're going to have to deal with redistricting. And we all know how happy parents get when we talk about redistricting. Um, but another thing that concerns me about developing the property is pollution. Um, when, peop when you have homes, you have people using um, chemicals on their grass. You have people with oil spills in their driveway. Um, you have gasoline-powered equipment being used um, in their yards. So it may not be the most, you know, serious concern, but it is an added concern that we will, by if we add 50 or however many homes that we're talking about, it does, is, is going to add to that, and we are in an area with wetlands and, and a lot of nature. So I would just really like to strongly suggest that our, our fellow citizens vote yes for the Keisha Farm acquisition. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Anybody else? Come on up, Andy. Good evening, everyone. Andy Edel, 944 Ridge Road. I just wanted to come out tonight in support of the purchase of Keisha Farms. Um, when I was on the council, we uh, uh, helped move along Lucas Farm. And at that time, it was a divided council. This one is fully supportive of this purchase so that I wanted to thank you all for being unanimous because it really is one of the last bits of open space that is available in our town we're overbuilt as it is so we really don't need any further houses so and everybody else has made very good points so I won't go there um, on the issue of the uh, I'm, I was here tonight really to hear the MDC presentation uh, and uh, I hear the complaints of the residents down there but this project really began before I was even on council starting in 1999. We were trying to find ways to deal with the overflow uh, that go comes into Gulf Brook, which caused the South Sea and Highway to have their sewer drains lifting at in dur different times when the storms got bad. Where uh, This project is desperately needed. Um, they're working as quickly as they can. In fact, uh, the former town manager did get, uh, get approval for the uh, worker work to continue over the winter, which normally would not have been able to happen. So this project is moving along quicker than anticipated. So we'll just, you know, I'm sure Jason heard those complaints and we'll do his best to deal with them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. 
uh, with your first presentation on the MDC, a project they call the, <coughs> the Clean Water Act. I voted no against it a long time ago because I believed it would have been nothing else but a ripoff. And not only a ripoff, but a deep, dark hole just like our government right here. We just keep throwing money into it and we get very little out. Now, from what I'm hearing tonight, it appears our rates will continue increasing. And there, there's no end to this. And it started off at, what, $1.2 billion uh, project. It, it, they added more onto it, again, to two point something billion dollars. And now what they're talking about really is more and higher. It's a shame uh, government just can't get it right. <coughs> And with all the repairs they had to do, over time, they should have been investing on a regular basis into their infrastructure instead of not doing anything and just sitting back and just doing some repairs. They should have been doing these issues and, and making the city of Hartford uphold what they should have been doing. Instead, they were flooding the Weathersfield Cove and with all their overflows, creating a problem for all of us. I don't have good words for the MDC whatsoever. As for the last meeting that you had, Mayor, and you shut me off, you and Mr. Lesser, um, I was very surprised at that meeting to hear that the town had an appraisal for the Keisha farm. At the presentation, there was no mention whatsoever about any appraisal, and I kept sitting back here waiting to hear and see. And as I know about appraisals, and I don't know a great deal, but I know enough. There's a lot of data in there that, that gives you an idea about the property. It tells you how many building lots the property might have yield. People were coming up here saying 90 building lots, 60 building lots, other kinds of numbers. And every damn one of you sat here. You've read that appraisal. And you didn't say a word through the first meeting, the second meeting, and then the third meeting, of course, while I was complaining about why you didn't have one. And then we got to the end of my talk, and the mayor mentioned, oh, we do have an appraisal after two and a half meetings. That's what you call transparency. That's exactly what you people are. You don't, nine of you sitting here knew this. At the very first meeting, and not one, and including the town manager, she knew, 10 of you, and not even mentioned it. You waited until the third meeting to throw it out. And that was only because I was complaining there was no appraisal. And then when you, when it took how long, Kathy? 10 days, 11 days for you to send me an appraisal on this property. When did I get it? I first asked for it at the last meeting. I went home that night and sent an FOI, and I got it Friday, later on in the day. And what was it? It was something that was written for the year, for July 31st, 2014. Not very up to date. And I can understand why you didn't want to talk about it, because of the date. The damn thing is obsolete. Four years old for an appraisal, it should be very current. And does it mention the, the, the property that was sold in Windsor, the 95 acres for $2.1 million? Not at all, because this is obsolete. You went and you took an appraisal from the seller. It's not even a town of Wethersfield appraisal. It's an appraisal from the seller. You walked in to negotiate with his appraisal in your hand, or he handed it to you, and that's all you had to work on for numbers. No wonder you paid so much money. If you would have had an appraisal done by your own appraiser, he would have set you in the direction, and he would have showed you how to bring the price where it should have been. Instead, you walked in with blindfolds on, 
This is my way of thinking. Any stupid person that would read their appraisal and give them their price says a heck of a lot. Okay, about wrap the it up. In five minutes are up. I know you did that to me the last time too, Mayor. Yes, and, please and wrap it up. And I will wrap it up. So anyway, while I'm looking through this, I, I, I just cannot conceive the fact that you would go forward and, and sign a deal using information that's four years old and all from four years on till now, you have no idea what was going on in the marketplace. Okay, thank you. You can continue yes, your madam, comments at the I'll end of back. the meeting. Thank you. Mr. Orsini in the back. Good evening, Mike Orsini, 224 Highland Street. I don't have to read the email, correct? Um, is somebody reading the um, Mr. Manusos's email? I wasn't going to, but well, I don't know what the direction was. He's, you you he sent us it. an email from him. He said, him. "Could I pass it along to the rest of the council?" Okay, thank you. Okay, um, obviously, I'm here in regards to the Keisha, Keisha Farms project. Um, as everyone knows, I've been involved with youth sports for a number of years. Um, I was involved with the um, obviously the, the turf at Catone Field, but also with the um, the original Mill Woods project back in '99. And uh, I've got a I really don't have a stake in the game. The only thing I could say is that I look at the Keisha Farm every morning when I leave for work because it's right across the street from me. Um, I know the property very well. Used to hunt there as a kid. Um, as someone related, you're not going to get 90 lots in there. It's, that won't happen. Um, the people that were here earlier tonight that live at 92 Collier Road, which is the last house if you're heading southbound on the left side, keep in mind, 30 yards deep in back of their house, it's all wetlands from there to Incarnation for no one that you know, looked at the map or anything. Um, in regards to the project and in, in the purchase, um, the organizations, uh, Baseball, lacrosse, football, and soccer. No one could be here tonight. That's why I'm here. Um, for the reason of the purchase, because the, the long term is for the, to put athletic fields there. Um, the way they look at it is just want to make sure that the support's there for the purchase of the project, but we want the long haul of it, not just to buy it and then end up sitting on it. Um, I know there's a lot of research that's done um, surveying the land, stuff like that. The land, there is a lot of dirt that does have to get moved on that on that on that piece of property, um, but it's definitely doable. To those people that live at Fuller, I totally understand about the parking because parking will be an issue there too, um, and that's something to consider. And also, got to consider, along with parking, you know, sanitation, um, bathrooms, stuff like that. So with that, um, I think it, you know. We, we do support it, but again, we want to make sure that it does get done to the full extent because we do have the Wilkes Farm, that is, the Wilkes slash Leonard Farm, which is plenty of open space for us, and I hope you use your best decision in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Good evening, Robert Gary, 17 Lembo Drive. <clears throat> I'm here tonight about um, the MDC project, not about the Wilkes Farm. <laughs> I said my piece. Uh, but my mother lives on Casey Lane, and I think the worst possible location to live right now is the Zapacas house. So I do hope you go look that. Um, you know, that one particular spot, because they took the snow shelf, and I understand, you know, these projects, they take time and you have to do this, but that one spot, they took the snow shelf and made it an active traffic lane. And then they put up orange barriers along the sidewalk. So if you're pulling out of Casey Lane, at the sidewalk, you're in an active traffic lane. And you can't see over these barriers. I mean, we don't even let my mother drive anymore, which is another blessing. But um, <laughs> you know, she's, she's so short now. She can't see it. You could not possibly see over that barrier as a passenger in a car when you're trying to take a right or left turn onto Middletown Avenue from Casey Lane. So it's really, really bad there. Um, I do hope the intersection gets open soon because I have to go on a ridiculous loop to get to my mother's house 
from my own house. But um, I think it's far more important that the Casey Lane section be taken care of in the immediate term. Second thing, while it is a war zone down there, um, there are ridiculous gaps in the sidewalks on Middleton Avenue. When you take a, you know, I walk my mother's dog, you go out of Casey Lane, take a right, and the sidewalk abruptly ends on one side. And there's no sidewalk on the other side either. So that's a very busy street. I don't know how that ever happened, but there's one section of Middletown Avenue toward Middletown Lane, no sidewalk on either side of the street. And then when you take the turn now where they're going to build the apartment building, you, one side of Mill Street has no sidewalks. And then the third place there's a problem, the south side of Route 3 from Middletown Avenue to the South Saint Highway has no sidewalk. It's ridiculous. So it's a pretty dangerous place to walk in that neighborhood. All right. Those are the kind of infrastructure issues we have without buying more land and building more facilities. All right. I got it in. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Come on up. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Paul Milne, 52 Livingston Street in Weathersfield. Yeah. Um, I'm glad the water quality is improving in the sound. I'm glad we're treating our sewage. I think that's a, a great thing that's happening. Um, but I don't know anybody else in here. I was a little shocked at. Um, they think I can spend 2% of my income on this. Um, I don't have any other solutions to offer you, but um, I did want to point out just a little bit of finagling in my head as I saw some of those graphs. If, if we're at 1% now, in five years, we're going to be at that 2% limit. Th those things were doubling in five years or 10 years. They're doubling by then. And then again, the EPA says that we can afford that much money. And they switched it around a little bit so that Hartford was at the max and we writ them in and they could play a little bit of games and things. But if we couldn't, if the EPA said we we're supposed to, if we couldn't, do we need to look a little bit further? Maybe the EPA has some funds they can slide our way. Maybe MDC did have some money invested somewhere that they can be accountable for and it can go back to help us out a little bit. But I, I really think that 2% that is a lot of money. And it's going to be 4% in 10 or 15 years. It's just that chart was climbing fast. I don't know if, if they've, I don't have the solution. I hate to pose a problem without having a solution to it, but I'm just saying, are there any other avenues that can be looked into? Um, are there are resources that can be thrown at this problem so that we can treat our sewage properly. And this, this is only the, the drain pipe end of it. I mean, we're looking for 2060. I mean, this is a long ways down the road. Things are going to change. Don't, I'm not fooled that this is going to change quickly. But the other end is what's going into the pipes and what we're doing as a community and how resourceful we're being with conservation. My, my water bill is pretty low. Um, that, that's, that's really all I wanted to say about that issue. And then just in case I wanted to throw in a little bit of, um, what do they call it, armchair quarterbacking. <laughs> um, it sounds to me like some of the traffic issues in this war zone for the project is from workers parking their cars on the streets. Why couldn't a supervisor come in tomorrow and say, you guys park in that parking lot over there today. Oh, 15, 16, 20, 30 of you park over there and get in and we'll carpool you over to your stuff. You don't have to have your car on the site. Give us a little bit more freedom on our streets. Not my street, but like I said, armchairs. All right, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Come on up. Good evening, David Kruk, 149 Broad Street. Um, I want to talk about the MDC too. Uh, I uh, I was a little surprised. I, I saw a lot of these graphs. I didn't really uh, pay too much attention. I was just paying attention to the the bottom line: how much it's going to cost uh, the the residents of our town, and um, and it was uh, depressing. And I was thinking, uh, well, you know, we're not going to pay much uh, when it's over. When they're done, our prices will go down, but that won't be until 40 years. So in 40 years, I'll be uh, one step away from the grave. So I'm going to be paying for the rest of my life, basically, as long as I'm living in Wethersfield. For and 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 it's not going to be just this. Uh, uh, 
one rate increase, it's going to increase every five years for the rest of my life here, probably. You know, I'll, I'll be 90 by the time they're done. And, and, and you look at Middletown Avenue, I hope that that's not what we're going to see for the next 40 years, streets like Middletown Avenue, because that, you know, if that's the case, then our rates might go down a little bit if they, if they figure a property value, because our property values will go down. If, if we have streets looking that bad for 40 years, you know, it's, it's very depressing just to think of. I, um, I don't know if, I, I probably missed that part where they said how long this construction and tearing apart streets are, is gonna go on. I hope it's not gonna go on for 40 years uh, as, as part of the water, clean water um, project. But, um, you know, what, I, what I'm thinking is, is, as far as this infrastructure, I, I wish the state could chip in. You know, maybe not this year, but I, I wish we could find a way for the state to chip in because this is, this is a, a lot of money for these eight towns to, to cover, and it's going to go up every five years. And, and I don't see how this is going to help bring people into these eight towns. You're going to say, well, uh, would you like to move to our town? Uh, 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 look at Middle Town Avenue. That's what it's going to look like, and and our, your rates are going to go up every five years. You know, I it, it's just a very unfortunate situation we're in now, and and uh, I, uh, you know I don't know what to say other than I hope we can get money from the state. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Jim. Jim Woodworth, uh, 33 Mill Street. Um, I can't not say anything about Mill Street and uh, the project that's been plaguing us all. Um, but I'm with uh, Rob Geary in the sense that this is going to be done pretty soon. And the lady that lived on Follybrook, this is going to be the bypass to the bypass. And uh, <clears throat> I know how the uh, sidewalks never got completed because they, when they built houses at a certain time, they said put sidewalks in, but they never connected them. And uh, when, that, when that floodgate is opened, which it will only be before Thanksgiving, hopefully, um, the traffic is going to go crazy. And we are going to need all of those traffic shortening, traffic uh, calming uh, techniques that we've been talking about on the uh, bicycle uh, pedestrian uh, committee. <clears throat> and uh, I hope that those can be applied, and certainly we have to rebuild this, half the street, uh, that those things get applied. As, as uh, Rob is saying, um, out of Casey Lane, no sidewalk on either side. When you, they never completed the sidewalks from the Mil, uh, Middletown Avenue to the railroad tracks, and people have to walk in the center. When that traffic comes back, sometimes it, uh, it's, uh, it's bumper to bumper. Uh, during uh, anyway, so that's really important, and uh, I'm thinking one of those traffic strips and to, to just as you pass what the uh, from Maple Street into uh, Middletown Avenue. Anyway, I also I came here really to talk about vote yes on the Keisha uh, <clears throat> referendum to save that farm. It's uh, it's it's such an opportunity. Everybody's got. You know, thoughts about how it should be. There's, there's the scenic view of a farm in Wethersfield that's so developed. True, there's, you know, there is the Wilkes farm, but, but this is a unique farm. It's on a different corner. It has a 1918 barn. That's historic, even though we think of 300 years old as historic, but this is historic uh, 20th century dairy barn. Um, it is that soil that is prime soil. And we, obviously we have the, uh, the need for the fields, uh, especially fields where you could include the parking, which will solve a parking problem on that road, which is another traffic problem. And, and that's got to all be dealt with. Uh, so anyway, we have this opportunity, as the young man uh, described. And as I know, as a Great Meadows Conservation Trust guy, that when there's a piece of property that's available because you have a willing seller, uh, you got to grab it. And, and this is the last big piece. So uh, vote yes on the uh, question number three. Question number two, one and two also, but that's another subject. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Tom? Good 
Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. I wanted to speak briefly about MDC, not particularly about what was raised today. The ad valerum concept. Is there any, well, let's say, I would hope there's some long range plan to try and get us off this ad valerum concept. It just makes no sense whatsoever for a person to live in Hartford and pay less to flush their toilet than it does for a person in Wethersfield. It's just the bottom line. Um, tying a sewage flow to the value of a property makes no sense whatsoever. I happen to live in a large home that I think I bumped my head when I moved there, but there's <laughs> only two people living there. I could count how many times we flush the toilet or run water down the drain, and we're going to pay a ton more money for our sewage bill through the ad valerum process. It's just not right. Um, and I don't know how the town of Wethersfield can go about forcing a change, maybe getting along with other, other high-paying members. Obviously, somebody from Hartford's not going to try and make the switch because it's going to work in the opposite direction for them. Their, their sewage bill is going to go up to where it should be. Uh, I just think something should be done. And this is not a short-term thing. This is a long-term thing. Maybe it takes 10 years, but I would hope there's some way we could start doing that. I know we always... You always get consumed trying to put out the fire that's closest to you. This is maybe a pie in the sky dream, but you know I think something should be done to to try and head down that direction. The other uh, item, totally unrelated, has to do with planning. I know there was some a lot of comments tonight about you know somebody's going around saying we need a plan, we need a plan. Well, that's me. I think we need a plan for everything we do. I think that's the way a town should be run. And uh, the planning that I'm talking about has to do with planting of trees on our roadways. There's a, there's a program where we're replanting trees on the snow shelf. Well, just down the street from me on Walcott Hill Road, there was three trees just planted. The snow shelf is, I didn't measure it, but the snow shelf's probably average, it's probably eight or 10 feet. And there's power lines, utility lines, in the center of that snow shelf, and they planted the trees there under the lines. Now, hopefully they picked a variety of tree that doesn't grow that fast, which I think they did, but it is gonna grow eventually up to the point where the town of Wethersfield is gonna have to spend money to trim trees. Worse than that, they planted them close to the sidewalk, the sidewalks that constantly get uplifted by roots, which the town, when they take a tree down like that, the town goes out and pays for the replacement of the sidewalk that the tree roots, the town tree roots damaged. But that's more cost to the town of Wethersfield. The concept of planting trees on a snow shelf has really become obsolete because everybody wants to have this nice tree-lined street, um, but the reality is we're now using salt, and salt to remove snow is not good for trees. So we put the salt on the road, the town plows come by, they push the salt and snow up on the snow shelf, and eventually it kills the trees. Then we have to pay to have the trees removed then we have to pay to put more trees in. Quite a few years back when there was a town manager, Ralph DeSantis, he came up with a plan of let's plant the trees on the resident's property. Let's offer it to them. So you want to plant more trees? That's great. It's good for the environment. You go down Walker Hill and you knock on the door and say, Mr. Mazzarella, how would you like a free tree? We'll put it on your front lawn, we'll place it there for you, and we'll place it such that it's located away from the street, 
away from the power lines and away from the sidewalks. And nine out of 10 people say, hey, that's great, I got something for free. But you've accomplished the same task. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Rue, come on up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I got a bunch of scribbled notes here. It's been a very interesting meeting. I'm going to start off on, on, on a question that I had for MDC. I happen to be a retired engineer and go past that big project on Maple Street, and it's the most interesting thing I've ever seen in my life. I asked uh, 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 Gardo this afternoon or this evening if you could give me a tour of that, what's down in that hole. I I use, you use the word tunnel a lot, and it was described to me by one of the employees that there's actually going to be a tunnel and a pipe inside the tunnel. Is that correct? So people can go in there. Well, they, they, they could go in there to repair. We can, Ms. Go, in, we can go with no different than any other story. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I was intrigued by the concept of a tunnel. And somebody said, I said, you mean guys can go in there and fix it when it leaks? It's not going to do that. Okay, Mr. Right. Luke, you've remember, answered my no question. Back and forth I still like to take that tour. It looks like a very interesting project, okay? A uh, couple of things. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the traffic problems. Progress is always painful. It's painful for me, it's painful for you. When we ask you to do different things, it's painful. You don't want to do it, and that's a big problem. And uh, 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 Matt brought up the, uh, the, the parking, or people brought up the parking in dangerous places. Well, there are problems all over town in parking in dangerous places. There are problems in crossing Silas Dean in dangerous places. And I just had a recent experience delivering my great-grandson to school or going to pick him up. I forgot what it was. I was coming down Somerset Street, and I wanted to make a left turn, but I couldn't make a left turn. A big red arrow, okay? So I stopped, and hmm, and they had all kinds of barriers there. And so I stopped, and ha-ha, I looked out, and I saw a big opening between the, between the uh, cones that were on the street. I said, that's where I'm supposed to go. Oh, well, there's no direction. There happened to be a policeman right close by, and I looked at him, and he was busy watching what the guy's doing in the hole. And... Uh, so I took my chances and moved out, and I very gingerly, and some, one of the workers came and rushed over to me, and he, he helped me through. But the guy was still watching, in the, watching what was going on in the sewer. You know? So as we have these problems around town, I think the police in many cases have to take a more active role. In, in directing the traffic as traffic gets tied up as it does on Maple Street almost all of the time. Sometimes there are people there and the traffic is backed up and there's a lot of work going on. Other times there's, there's nobody there except the employees of the contractor with their signs trying to direct traffic. So the, it, it appears as though there are times where there's nobody there directing and there are times when somebody ought to be there and there's nobody there. You know, anyway. So anyhow, so uh, enough said. That's the fun part of what I wanted to share. Uh, I do also want to uh, support, and I have said this re uh, repeatedly, the purchase of Keisha Farm. Is it without its problems? It, it, I'm sure there are some concerns that we would have there. Uh, the, some of the concerns that I've had represent, what, what, from, based on what I hear, we've made up our mind we're going to have sports fields. And maybe there are segments of our governmental people here who've already made up their mind and said, we're going to have sports fields because we get some vague report that, oh, we need more sports fields. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. One of, the, one of our citizens, or who I'm usually in agreement with, he talked in terms of trying to develop a study that supports the need for sports fields. I took a different approach. I said, why don't we have a study that supports the lack of need for a sports field? And if it's so evident that it's necessary, that should surface. And I think I use the term some engineering type thinking in the future. So anyway, uh, uh, those are the couple of, a couple of the things that I've got in my mind. And I've got just one other point, the quickie. And again, this happens to be next to my pond. <laughs> my pond, the famous Cloverdale Pond, who I had to live with for many, many years with a lot of problems. 
We live in a house with a good view of the pond. My wife looks out. She's yelling at me, George, come up and look. Come up and look what the kids are doing out there. So I'm like, what, what do you want? Some, what's the problem? There were a couple of kids with a four-wheel off-the-road vehicle, good-sized, with a trailer attached, with a boat or something on it, <laughs> driving around on the, on the, on the, on the field, on the, on the grass, and all of a sudden, they go and they go through the stream on the, on the southwest corner of the thing. They go plowing through this stream, dragging this trailer and whatever. The four wheel is churning up the thing, of churning up the, the, the dirt. And then they're going onto the street with, this tra with a kid in the trailer. They're not even supposed to be on the street at all. And so I, I, I was busy looking, and I, I saw all this. I took my little handy ca phone, or phone camera, and I took pictures of the ruts, and I was trying to decide who to send it to, either the, the, to Amy or to the chief of police, or I'll send it to somebody, I'll share it. But the, 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 the problem, and, and interestingly, I, they headed west on, on Cloverdale Circle. So they didn't come from Hartford. They didn't come from Newington. They were my probably fairly poor people on the southwest end of Hart or Weathersfield, you know, who, who might have trouble paying a little extra for their water or something like that. So I got in my car. I was, had some errands to run. So I took a ride around the neighborhood because I, 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 yeah, because I anticipated, I anticipated that that thing might still be sitting in the driveway someplace. And if it was, I was going to go up and take a picture of it. But anyway, I think a little extra care is required on the part of the police to, to pay attention to these kinds of infractions. And these are infractions that are probably at least tolerated by parents. And there doesn't appear to be a penalty on it. And one of our earlier speakers this evening, who was a neighbor of mine, he happened to see the thing, and it's, uh, he happened to see the incident also. So I just wanted to share that little bit of my wife and me keeping an eye on our pond. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Have we gotten to everybody tonight? Okay, last call. All right, we will declare the public comment portion closed. <laughs> no, I'm getting tired. Okay, we have council reports. Are there any council members with reports this evening? Councilor Breton. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I wanted to just remind folks of the bike walk open house that is occurring on um, October 30th, 6.30 at the Pitkin Community Center. Um, and it's an open house to welcome the community to showcase the progress and present work and, and get support um, and information in terms of building the, the master plan for the uh, bike and walk um, effort. So. Um, it, yeah, to help make Weathersfield more bike and walk friendly. Thank you. Any other reports? Councilor Latina. Uh, the Disabilities Committee met in September, and one of the highlights from the meetings that they would like to have everybody know about is they've been talking about doing a new grant program that they would hand out quarterly. It's a $250 grant to a deserving applicant, um, and they'll start that in January, so we should start seeing some press releases and some information regarding that. So it's a nice new program, and they're very thankful that we kept them independent. Great, thank you. Any other reports? Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you. Uh, the EDIC committee met and went over the list of uh, vacant properties and where things stood on them, and uh, there is progress being made on some vacant properties right now to uh, have those filled. Uh, we were also updated on the upcoming uh, salute to business that will happen in December as usual. Uh, we'll be honoring some businesses in town. Uh, we talked about ribbon cuttings that uh, happened or were happening. Uh, had one at um, Stop and Shop for the renovation up on Jordan Lane that's been completely remodeled, and they had something there for that. Uh, there was a business after hours at William Revis uh, that we talked about, and they had uh, they do it every year along with raffles to raise money for uh, cancer research, and I think it was very profitable for them that night. And uh, we talked about the upcoming one that was held yesterday, which was the 75th anniversary for uh, Farley and Sullivan. Uh, they had an open house that they put on themselves that the mayor and uh, Councilor Lesser and I were at. So uh, uh, we, you know, 
we were appreciative to be there for 75 years of a company that's uh, been in existence. Thank you. Very good. Um, any other reports? Okay, how about moving into council comments? Any council members have comments this evening? Councilor Latina? Uh, I wondered if we could just follow up on a couple of things that were brought to our attention tonight. I'm, I know you're diligently taking notes, um, but engineering to look at the options um, on Folly Brook since the study did reveal that there are some issues out there. Um, I think, you know, just knowing the next steps and where we need to go with that would be helpful. Um, and then also, because we're now seeing and hearing from people about Harvey Fuller and Highcrest and parking issues and safety issues, I think we need to look out there at making some dedicated spaces, whether that's gravel and roping off or posting, you know, parking only on one side. I don't even know how you determine any of that, but if that's engineering or police, I think we definitely need to start looking at that. I would agree, Council Latina. I have that on my list too. That yeah. it's it, it's um, an issue that's plaguing different areas in town. I think we need to look at both the speeding and also the um, parking issues on streets. Thank yeah. you. Our first home was on Caliber, and that was ten years ago, and it was starting to get busy. So I can only imagine what it's like now. Sure, sure, I agree. Other comments still that end. Sure. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Hurley. Um, I agree with Jody about. What she said, so do. I won't repeat yeah. <laughs> it. I was also at Farley and Sullivan. I missed you guys, but I was down there at their open house. Um, I, I would just like to talk about Keisha Farm for a minute. I wasn't a big proponent of Wilkes Farm only because of the way it was purchased. Um, we limited the purchase. We can't really do anything with the land. It would have been nice. There's a lot of land. It would have been nice to put some a few fields on there, um, which probably would have limited the need for Keisha Farm. Um, and the road thing that somebody talked about was also, I mean, you could still put houses on the road sections of Keisha Farm in it. You don't have extra roads or extra services. Um, but if the Keisha, if the town residents do pass Keisha Farm, I fully support uh, recreation fields there for i mean i think when this first came up that was the idea that recreation we needed more land for recreation fields so i would fully support recreation fields going on that land are there other comments go ahead councillor rell i too would you know echo mike's support for recreational <coughs> fields for keisha property i supported it uh, it was a tough decision to support, um, not so much for the economic development side, but for, um, you know, what are we going to actually do with this property? Uh, I don't want the town to purchase it in, you know, if the, the public agrees in November to purchase it and not have a plan for what to do with it. Um, I would like to have uh, as much information to the public as possible. I know, you know, we're getting kind of close within three weeks to uh, Election Day, uh, but afterwards if the if the public does approve uh, on the ballot in November the purchase of it I would like to see something uh, planned out for within 12 months if we can get something within a year after the purchase to say exactly what the the plan is to to break the parcels down by you know wetlands what you know how much how much of the property cannot be developed be it for um, parking uh, outbuildings recreational fields or even you know hiking fields uh, hiking recreation um, if we can have a plan that puts out exactly what it can be used for um, it's kind of like a, a sped up process and I know at the last meeting um, Kathy Bagley had mentioned the mill woods plan and how that was uh, put together I think within the next 12 months we should have that um, so that uh, we know if this pros uh, uh, prospective property is only good for you know passive recreation hiking trails or something like that you know we do have Wilkes property that is already used for that that point um, if we look at it and it's it says that you know it can't be used for for much because the property is you know I don't know what a brownfield would be for um, you know open space um, but if there's too many hazardous materials or if it's too wet and it can't be used 
for recreation. I think the public needs to know that um, within a certain amount of time. If we don't get that information, or if that information shows that it can't be used for you know sports fields, um, then I think at that point the town should consider other options for it. Um, we would be the owners of this property, and if uh, it lays vacant or fallow for too long, um, I don't want that to be a burden on the the um, um, taxpayers who are voted for it um, this November. If I may just add um, a little information, if we if the voters do approve this in November, the town won't actually purchase it until sometime in March, probably, sometime in the spring. There'll be a, a process that we have to go through. There'll be an environmental study. There'll be soil samples. So if something uh, really detrimental came up, it would derail the sale of the property. Then once, the, if so if the voters vote in November to purchase it, then we take on that, that study in the environmental and the soil samples. And then at that point, we would own it next spring. So we're already out till the spring. And it's my understanding that a um, master plan process could take between nine months um, and a year to conclude. So we are looking at more like an 18-month time frame in order to have a master plan in place. That doesn't mean that we're not um, actively involved in the process, which I think everybody at this council um, dais has said we support fields. And it's our intention to do that. And we will still be here in office, the nine of us, come March, so that we would be able to, at that time, once we own the property, if it is approved in November, would then be able to go out and hire a consultant to, to undertake that master plan. So I am confident that we can um, move forward with making fields there um, as long as uh, you know the master plan uh, shows that the the topography or the whatever is um, is appropriate for the fields. So, um, you know, I, I fully support fields on that property. We do know there's four or five acres of wetlands. Uh, we know there's a barn on one part, and, you know, that property may not be suitable for, for fields. We'll have to wait and see what the master plan says. Um, like Mr. Orsini said, we would need some restrooms, we would need some parking lots. So, um, and I think all of that will be fleshed out in this master plan. Uh, but the timeline may be longer than 12 months, just um, because of the nature of the purchase uh, by the town. Um, so that's my two cents on that. Um, are there other people? Who, and the other thing is the explanatory text will be going out uh, at the end of this week, so it should reach homes maybe Saturday, maybe Monday of next week, um, because there are people in town who aren't familiar with this um, <laughs> referendum question, and hopefully the explanatory text will allow people to um, see what, what we're talking about when we're talking about the Keisha Farm purchase. Um, so anyway, do other people have comments? Um, just to Bob Young, I'm not sure why he got the old appraisal from the owner, but the town did, did get an appraisal in, 2000, in sometime in 2018. I can't remember the exact date. And the town attorney said that's part of our negotiations and isn't available to the public at this time. Okay. But the Keisha appraisal was not part, was not done on our behalf, so that was... Um, available to so him. Bob probably should have known that but we did it in in part of the reason that it took a while to get to him is we had to have that conversation with the town attorney and we also did speak well I didn't the town spoke to the Keisha family to let them know that the appraisal was going to be made public so we weren't hindering um, the process we were going through the proper procedure for it the council members, Councilor Breton. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also support the purchase of Keisha, Keisha Farms. Um, I um, I supported it when we were uh, voted to bring it to a referendum for public vote. Um, I've talked to a lot of folks in the last few weeks um, at community events, and um, I think there was a lot of uh, positive support. Um, many of those those folks were. Um, Invo are involved in sports and support it um, with their children in youth sports or coaches and the like. Um, and, you know, it really is a great opportunity, like everybody said. I think I'm just 
you know, preaching to the choir. Everybody's in support of this. Um, a couple of points of, of clarification. Um, the land, uh, it, you know, we've said it, it's purchased by the town and the town has the ability to define its use within the construct of the, of the referendum, which is recreational use, open space, and municipal use. So we, we, I wanted to clarify there's some misconceptions that, you know, we, with some folks, that, um, that it's tied to, you know, we might have a stipulation in there, but this is clearly a different situation than Wilkes. Um, and I am too in support of using the land for playing fields. I think, uh, you know, having kids going through the sports um, and my husband coaching, you know, there's always a, there's always a need for more fields. Um, and so I think this would be a great space for it. Um, and we also talked about the wetlands, um, probably not the best suited, but it, that's only 5.1 acres of 32 acres. So um, I'm really proud that um, the that the mayor and the, the town managers and the folks on the council have um, looked at this as, as a great opportunity and to let the public decide. So um, I'm hoping that people will um, consider that when they vote and really think about um, the chance to not miss this opportunity. So thanks. Other comments? Councilor Rell? Well, to piggyback off of what you had said about the springtime, I think we should have a um, another, well, obviously we'll have public hearings, but we should have um, a vetted public input from any consultant that we hire uh, to look at. So the, per the if it's my understanding, we'll have the referendum question in November, and then we will have four months, roughly, to have a um, consultant come in and talk about the property. I and believe it, it's it's wrapped up with the um, the purchase. I think it's the Kathy. Correct me if I'm wrong. The town attorney um, in the closing documents and the soil sample and environmental study are all what happens during that four month period before the town actually signs the deeds. Is that accurate to say? That's correct. The uh, town attorney has just said that uh, depending on how the voters go in November, if it is approved, then it will take a little time just to get everything um, studied, wrapped up, and ready to go for final signing. Then I think we should have um, some type of public input at that point uh, just so that they know. Um, you know, hearing Mr. Young's comments that he he's only going from the 2014 appraisal, he didn't get the full facts, the full information. And I understand some stuff is privy to just this council, um, but I think anything that we learn in that those samples, anything that you know could affect um, what we do with that property going forward after we purchase it in in the spring, should be if we if we do purchase it. Um, it should be open to the public. They should know, um, you know, what we plan on doing with it going forward from that point on. So it would just be my recommendation that we have some type of um, public forum for the the public to know, um, at least at that point of which we buy it, what our plans are for that property. I mean, it won't have the full master plan that will say X number of fields and what sports will be involved. But I think at least when we sign the deed and we own the property come springtime, uh, that we give the public an opportunity to hear from um, not only us, but from whatever consultant we have, what the plans are and what that property could tolerate, I guess. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I just had a few others. I, I did mention the explanatory text is going out at the end of the week. Um, the 23rd annual Scarecrows along Main Street are up, so if you get a chance, stop by and, and uh, check out that display. Um, I would like to thank town staff for their assistance. It was a busy weekend in Old Weathersfield. Town staff was out all weekend um, assisting with the Cove Carnival and thank the Keene Foundation for hosting that again this year. It's a great community event. Um, also, town staff was involved with the Mikey's Place 5K on Sunday morning. Um, Kathy was here all weekend. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and finally, the Tourism Commission is holding its annual photo contest, and those photos appear in our annual report. 
So if you have some photos you'd like to submit, there's more information on our town website, and that date is um, coming up quickly. So get those photos in if you have them. Um, and now we'll move on to the town manager's report. Do you have anything? No report. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, town clerk, do you have any communications this evening? Uh, I do. We have um, absentee ballots are available in my office Monday through Friday. I will be here November 3rd on Saturday from 9 to noon to do uh, absentee battle, uh, uh, ballots for people. Um, and we have, let's see. That's pretty much it. You have to register to vote if you live in town already by October 30th. So October 30th is the cutoff from, for photo registration? Will, registrars will be here from 9 to 8 p.m. So 9 a.m. in the morning to 9 to 8 p.m. to register to vote. Thank you. And did you receive some uh, letters from public comment? Yes, I do. I have uh, one from Mel Melanie Adams Brogan. Morgan. My family lives in Wethersfield. My children, Maven and Anthony, both attended Charles Wright Elementary School. Last year, my daughter, Maven, was diagnosed with brain cancer, which is terminal upon diagnosis with a prognosis of 9 to 12 months. She fought hard for eight months before succumbing to cancer. She never got to celebrate her seventh birthday. Although she was only a kindergartner when diagnosed, Charles Wright Elementary supported our family through her diagnosis by buying Team Maven shirts, planning fundraisers, a last day of radiation celebration, awareness days, and by planting and dedicating a tree on school grounds in her memory. We are eternally grateful to have the support of the administration, staff, teachers, students, parents, and the whole community of Charles Wright Elementary. We now des desire to give back to the children in a way that also furthers the memory of our daughter Maven. I am singing the praises of the Charles Wright community because I believe it is as a sign outside its doors, says the Pearl of Wethersfield. I also believe they are being underserved by the town and parts in, rec in particular who is in charge of maintaining the grounds around the school. Charles Wright has been in need of new backlop, blacktop for a number of years as the, they, the play surface behind the school has become unsafe for children to play on particularly in the winter months when it heaves. Last school, uh, principal, our prince, last school year, Principal Glenn Horder um, drew up an amazing plan to resurface and expand the black hop behind the school so the children can play without hazards. At the same time, I was informed the school that my family and I are willing to donate a swing set to the school as a way of giving back to the community while honoring the memory of my daughter. At the time, I was naive enough to think that since I would secured the funds to purchase a swing set, that the process of getting the swing set on school grounds would happen quickly and smoothly. I was wrong. From what I know, the plan for the, backdrop, the blacktop and for the swing, swing set has been denied because when it went out to bid, there was only one bidder and that bid was too high. After that, the town council decided to realloc reallocate funds to removing oil tanks from several school properties around town, and so, or so I've been told. This has left Charles Wright Elementary yet again without a proper and safe play surface, and without a swing set that would offer sensory and motor skills development to children. I propose that the Park and Rec again puts money aside for the, back to, the blacktop and for whatever land preparation needs to happen for the swing set to go in and to go out for a bit again. Our children deserve a better play space to work on their gross motor skills and to relieve stress from the school day, both of which will create better learners and happier learners. Also, children with autism and other types of sensory processing disorders greatly benefit from playground equipment such as swings. I believe my points are still valid whether or not Charles Wright becomes decommissioned as a school in five to ten years. Five years is long is how long my kindergartner, Anthony, has left at Charles Wright. It would be an injustice to him to have the town council drag their feet long enough for him to never see or use his sister's memorial swing set. Are you willing to help let that happen? Please tell me that we can now work together to get the best outcome in this matter. And the other is, she also has maybe 10 pictures included. 
Um, I have another letter from Cynthia Greenblatt, Broad Street. Um, members of the town council, the town of Wethersfield has the opportunity to purchase the Keisha Farm property. Referendum question three states that the land would be purchased for three uses, recreational, open space, and other municipal purposes. By any measure, the acquisition of land is a benefit to our community. What is the cost to the town? Concerns about costs and tax implications are understandable. However, it is more cost effective to buy the farm than it is to have it developed. With taxpayers sharing, the cost of the acquisition taxes will increase by $16 for every $8,000 paid, and then decrease every year after that until the bond is paid. What is the property worth? The benefits of this purchase makes it priceless. Some of the farm property abuts Highcrest School and can become part of that campus. The land can be used for recreational purposes and with community input and planning, it will be supported and expanded for our youth sports programs. The preservation of the land will limit the cost <coughs> association with the possible increase of school age children. As an added incentive, property adjacent to or near open space has a demonstrate, demonstrated higher value increasing our tax revenue. How will this impact the environment? Land will be preserved as open space, adding to our greenway, purifying our air and absorbing the rains and snow. Wetlands that comprise about five acres of the property will support wildlife and clean water while established habitats will be protected. All of this adds to the beauty of our town. One of the primary reasons for so many families choose Wethersfield as a place to call home and stay for generations. One of two things will happen. This property will either be bought by the town, allowing, allowing our community to control the future of the land, or it will be bought by developers for their profit, and we will pay for services of the development. This is the decision before us on November 6th. Join me on voting yes for question three. Thank you, Dolores. And Kathy, would you just follow up on the first letter? I know you've um, spoken to Mrs. Borgen and you've um, addressed some of her, her concerns. Would you just let the rest of the council know that about that conversation? Sure, I had a phone conversation um, with Melanie regarding both the swing set and the basketball court and the blacktop area behind the school. I let her know that the information she had was incorrect about the money being not available for the um, basketball court or the play area. Council never took that money, and I let her know that. That money is still there. The, uh, we're ready to go back out to bid with it again in the early spring so that once school gets out in June, that we'll be putting in that new blacktop, the basketball court, and do all of that work. So she understood that. I also explained to her that I'll be meeting with the PTO to discuss with them uh, the swing set, the location, <clears throat> excuse me, the best, uh, the best place for that at the school. If you can appreciate, Charles Wright has a very limited uh, outdoor grass areas, and to put in a swing set takes a little time and effort. And the safety zone, most people don't realize for a swing set is fairly large because of everything the kids do with the swings besides just swing on them. So we have to make sure we put it in a, an appropriate area. So um, the PTA, uh, PTO is aware that um, we're available to meet with them and they're gonna be in touch with us in the very near future to set that up. And I'm gonna keep Mrs. Borgen uh, advised of that as we go through this process. So she was good with all that information. And we did go out to bid on it, and the quote was way higher. We only had one bidder, and the amount was just way higher than we had anticipated. So the, your hope is that we'll get several bids, and it'll be a, a better price in the spring. Is that right? We should get competitive bids. We were trying really hard to get it done this past summer, and we went out and only got one bid, and we think the bidder just threw in a number just to see if we would take it, and it was way over budget and we could not do it. Uh, we did try to do it very quickly over the summer. It didn't happen, but they're aware of that now, and we're gonna move forward with it. And they know it's one of my priorities because it takes us a long time sometimes just to make those projects get to the top of the list, and there's no way we were giving up that money. Okay, thank you. Um, now moving into our uh, council action, we have some um, 
Resignations. I have a resignation from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Antonio Margiato, 155 Stocking Hill, Stocking Mill Road. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Are there other resignations? Yes, uh, for the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, a resignation of Barbara Higaby. 126 Valley View Drive, her term was from 9-17-18 to 6 20 From the Wethersfield Advisory Commission for People with Disabilities, Reno Ray Lampro, 108 Meadowview Drive, term of 7-1-17 to 6 19 From the Wethersfield Heritage Commission, uh, Elizabeth Thompson, was formerly the Historic District so area she's at uh, 148 uh, Clearfield Road from 917-18 to 630-21. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any, any uh, discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes. Um, we also have some appointments to boards and commissions. I have a, uh, two appointments to the Youth Advisory Board, Dylan Knapp for the under 21, 37 Round Hill Road, 10, 15, 18 to 6, 30, 21, and Eric Knapp as a town employee for the Wethersfield Police Department, 10, 15, 18 to 6, 30, 21. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Excuse oh. me. Yep. Do you have um, Weathersfield advisory for to fill a vacancy? Oh, uh, John Beretta. Yeah. yeah. Well, we were just doing. Oh, you want me to read them all? Sorry. Uh, Weathersfield advisory committee for people with disabilities. Another appointment. John Beretta, forty Tollgate Road, ten fifteen eighteen to six thirty nineteen. Okay. Thank you. So we have the three of them. A uh, motion for the three of them and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Are there more appointments? Yes, uh, to the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, Pastor Philip D. Barnes, 840 Silestine Highway, for a period 10 15 18 to 6 30 20. And the Planning and Zoning Commission, from alternate to regular member, Dan A. Silver, 23 Orchard Brook Drive, from 10 15 18. To 6:30-19. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Okay. Dolores, do you have that? Yes. Any abs uh, abstentions? Motion passes. All right. Um, the unfinished business is remaining on the table. We move into other business. Weathersfield Town Council 2019 meeting dates. Do we have a motion? Councilor Forrest. Move to approve the meeting dates of the town, uh, Weathersfield Town Council for the year 2019 as detailed in the agenda. Okay, very good. Do we have a second? Second. All right, any questions, any comments? Councilor Rell. Just, uh, it's a comment and I'd probably put it into a motion. Uh, the I've said it before the November 4th uh, election or the Monday before the election uh, I don't think there's a reason right now to cancel that I know we typically do but we do have time you know in the September and the two October meetings to discuss uh, whether or not we need that to cancel it right now not knowing what could possibly happen in you know early November late October you have no idea if there's an October snowstorm or anything and I understand we can always have a call for a special meeting but there's probably no reason to have a call for a special meeting if we do have one uh, already scheduled for November 4th so I would make a motion not to cancel the Monday November 4th uh, meeting uh, and that if we do need to cancel it uh, due to you know whatever people do before election um, that we make that decision in October or you know anytime before okay um, is there a second 
I'll second. <laughs> okay. Um, I've had conversations with the Registrar of Voters who have indicated that they do need to set up this space the day before the election. Um, and that was the, one of the driving forces in canceling the meeting. <clears throat> Mr. Hurley. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> you did, and your, your wife asked me to make sure we canceled the meeting so she could set up council chambers. She's watching at home, too. <laughs> I still agree with Michael Rell. <laughs> Very well. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to support the, that part personally because I, I have heard from town staff that they do need that, that day to set up the council chambers. So um, there is a motion for an amendment. Um, all in favor for the amendment? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, those opposed? No. 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 Any abstentions? Okay. The motion fails. We um, have the original motion on the table. Is there any more discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, emergency management grant. Do I have a motion? Uh, move to approve the grant request for an emergency management performance grant. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Town manager? This is an annual grant that um, we can apply for through the state of Connecticut. It's a, an annual grant of approximately $13,184. And that helps cover for us the, uh, the emergency management director stipend and certain supplies for the emergency operations center. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Next we move on to bids. We have a one bid for rock salt. Do I have a motion? Motion to award the Rock Salt bill to DRVM for $62.50 a ton and to Eastern Salt for $60.20 a ton. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Every year the town uh, goes with our, um, our crag bid for uh, Rock Salt for when the snows come. Uh, we always select the two lowest vendors so that we always have an ample supply of, of the salt for the winter, and these two bidders were the low bidders at that time. Are there any questions? Councilor Hurley? Um, just for Kathy, is the $60.20, that's not a typo because it went down a dollar or $2.30 from last time? No, that isn't a typo. I double checked the bid with Craig. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Councilor Rell? Uh, just by simple calculation, $187,000 we spent last year. That's roughly 3000 according to like the 6250 um, price per ton. That's roughly 3,000 tons uh, in the salt shed or wherever, you know, we had to use it. And I know forecasting is not a, a science, but we are all always over with the exception of 2016. Um, 2015 we were you know nearly double the amount is there have we budgeted do we know how much we've budgeted for um, this year total amount in rock so I mean or is the 150 what that was last year's do we have I, I don't have this year's, but based on the history that I see here, it looks like it, we would have done 150000 again. again. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it, it, just not knowing, you know, it did go up from 14 to 15, 125, held steady for three years at 150. I don't know if we were going higher than 150 um, or if we're keeping it at that level. So. I can certainly double check the budget and get back to you on that. But, okay. Yeah, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes. 
On to, uh, we have no ordinances or resolutions um, for introduction, so on to the minutes of September 17th. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any um, changes or corrections to the minutes? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Um, we have the meeting minutes of October 1st. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, any um, amendments, changes? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passed, motion carries. We are now back into public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. Please state your name. Come on up, Mr. Clinch. Jim Clinch, 903 Ridge Road. <clears throat> Going back in history a little bit, I want to talk about the assessor. Back in about, I'm just guessing, somewhere around 1996, I uh, bought a car on September the 30th, and uh, next June I got a bill charging me for the month of September. So I went to see the assessor, which was John Degato, and I asked him, how come you're charging me for a car that I didn't own. And he says, that's the way it is. We charge you for the whole month. <laughs> so I got into a heated discussion with him, and he was a fiery guy. And uh, we had some words, and I left. And uh, I went to see Senator Seattle and asked him, talked to him about it. And uh, he um, we, we made, uh, he, he presented a bill saying that uh, the car should be with the with the, the with the computers and stuff they should have been able to do it right to the day and so he designed a bill and it was passed by the legislature saying that um, you tax from the day you buy a car <laughs> i don't know if they still function like that but uh, that's the bill was passed Going to coming up uh, to uh, like three years ago, I have a um, Volkswagen uh, Beetle that I bought brand new. And uh, I was driving it one day, and a guy said to me, I hope you're not paying more than $50 for taxes for that automobile. And I said, Why? And he said, The legislature passed the law that uh, after 20 years it's antique. So uh, now, this is uh, three years ago, 2000, 2015, 14, whatever. So I went to the assessor's office and I told them, and they said, well, you don't have um, antique plates on a car. I said, the law says that I don't need antique plates. And they gave me a hassle, and finally, I had to pay the tax for that year. So. That, uh, the last two years, I've only paid $50. But uh, it really rubs me badly because I pay in, I paid $350 a year for like 10 years that I shouldn't have been paying for, and nobody notified me or anything. And I, they say it was my, my, uh, my responsibility. So uh, over the weekend, Sunday, I was looking at my assessment on my on a computer, and I seen exemptions, and there's it's exemptions right here, and it's blank. And I'm uh, I'm a veteran, disabled veteran. So I went this morning. I went to the assessor's office, and I asked him. I said, "Am I getting my exemption?" Because when I first filed it back with the Godaway, in fact, I still have a letter at home stating that. We only need to file it once, and it's good forever. And so I went to the assessor's office, and I told them that uh, this this uh, area is blank, that I don't have any exception, exemptions. She said, it's on your tax bill, and so she printed it out, and she put it right here. 
So I said, why, why won't you put it on this here, the exemptions? She said, because we don't want to, and we just don't do it. Now, if you have a box that says exemptions and is left blank, it tells me with, with my experience with the assessor that they don't want somebody knowing about something. So, you know, I, I think a lot of times I meet veterans all the time, and one of the things we always discuss about is the fact that in the town, in most towns in the state of Connecticut, there is an exemption. Why won't they put it on? There's the boxes on there. Why won't they put it in there? With it, where it says exemptions is beyond me. You know, I just, I don't know. I just don't understand it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We'll have Kathy. Um, we'll have Kathy Bagley look into that for you. Pardon? I'll have Kathy. I've asked Kathy to look into that for you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Mr. Mazzarella. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Wildcat Hill Road. I'm going to speak about Keisha Farms a little bit. There was uh, one speaker here that lives on Collier on the edge of the property. And... He, he said that, uh, you know, he thought it was a good idea because there'd be a little bit in this deal for everybody, and I disagree. I think there's three basic groups of people concerned about this purchase. We have people that want to preserve it as open space, the conservationists. We have people that want to use it for athletic fields. And there's another group of people that want to see it bring tax revenue into the town. And um, I happen to be in the third group. Um, I was a little bit on the edge when this project first came up uh, as to what I, wanted, what I thought should be done with it. And I think the problem is that the referendum question was structured incorrectly. It doesn't allow for the sale of any of the property. And I think if it had included that, you would have satisfied the needs of the vast majority of the people in town. You could have very easily developed parcels along Collier and Highland, and sold those as residential properties. I know I shouldn't be doing this. Um, I did talk to the town attorney, and he said we would have the ability to sell off parcels if we chose to. I don't believe that's correct. I've talked to another land attorney for another town, and he okay. said that is not the case. Our town well, attorney said that um, we would be able to sell off lots. Okay. The money would then have to go back into the bond, um, the bond cost. But you've had, well, I don't want to start a conversation. I know, we'll and, have and I'm cutting into your time, so we'll, continue. We'll have I, it after. Yeah. You reset the clock to zero? <laughs> you got you got an extra 20 seconds, okay, sir. Okay, thanks. I think you talked longer. <laughs> um, I wanted to point out uh, a couple uh, errors, I believe, in the explanatory text. Uh, under, uh, there's a listing of assumptions that the text is based on. And the third one down says the grand list will remain constant. Well, it can't remain constant if you're taking the Keisha Farms parcels out of the mix. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but it's, it's inaccurate. The other item that's been, that started quite a long time ago, we talked about a $16 uh, yearly charge diminishing over time. Um, based on a house that pays $8,000 in taxes. Well, the math doesn't add up. Um, I think it probably has something to do with including the, the financing costs in, but the numbers stated on the explanatory text work out to a tax bill of $6,819, not $8,000. So, you know, it's not a big thing, but um, there's been some comments that I'm 
spreading false information around town. It's not accurate. Hasn't been vetted by the town. And uh, I take that personally. There was uh, a couple people evidently uh, called to inquire as to why I was handing out literature at the uh, community center during a uh, flu clinic. And I talked to the uh, State Elections Enforcement Committee, Commission. Uh, Dolores gave me the phone number. I called them up. I spoke with an attorney. <clears throat> I told them exactly what I was doing, passing out literature concerning a referendum in a public place. Um, he said, I have absolutely every right to do that. Uh, it's a freedom of speech issue. We also discussed some of the rules and regulations that apply to this room. And I believe what we heard tonight from Councillor Breton violated the rules. You're not supposed to advocate either for or against the referendum question once the question is set. And you're basically advertising, advocating your interest in this uh, referendum question, and that's not allowed. And I don't know how you unring the bell. You've already said it to everybody that's watching. And I, I don't think that's fair. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Can I speak to that? Or can well, we uh, let, me, uh, let me just say that we did ask the town attorney if we could speak publicly in favor of something or against something. Uh, he said town employees cannot and no, pu no town money can be used. The town um, was paying for this room, for the lights, for this whole operation, for the broadcast of it. I disagree. And that's not what the mm -hmm. a letter from the state that was part of your uh, attachment in the explanatory text. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and again, we asked the town attorney, and he said we could. So we're going by the council. I'm going to call the SEEC again tomorrow okay. and ask them what their thoughts mm -hmm. on that is. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else from the public who'd like to speak tonight? Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, um, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Move to go into an executive session. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions, motion passes. I'm Thank so, you. I apologize. I did not know that. Notice that they weren't.